script. Okay. You have about one minute left. All right, it is seven o'clock. I will call this meeting to order. Uh, roll call will show that all five board members are present. Um, and uh, we will begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. Well, I guess we'll have to say the pledge ourselves rather than hear the College Park pledge for tomorrow. I still see it spinning. <laughs> so we'll go with our own. All right. Pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of, of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the Republic, Republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. For all. <laughs> All right, so we will begin uh, Ms. Amidzik with communications report. Yes, one moment. Communications for this evening. <clears throat> when the states, while the state Supreme Court took action to end the safer at home order effective immediately, the portion of the order closing K-12 schools through the end of June was not changed. A consortium of Milwaukee County communities, including the village of Greendale, issued an immediate plan as a response. Noticeable changes impacting the district include the reopening of playgrounds. As of last week, the JC Park and 84th and Grange site playgrounds are now open. Playgrounds on district elementary schools grounds remain closed because they are within construction zones at these buildings. This is the last scheduled week of classes for students in the Greendale schools. Seniors will pick up graduation gowns and personal belongings left in lockers on Thursday afternoon this week. The district received an extension from the Department of Public Instruction to run the meal program through June 26th. May 22nd will be our last day of serving meals at the high school, but we will continue our program at College Park through Friday, June 26th. The setup for the program will be the same with meals distributed in the Circle Drive at College Park School. They will be offered from 11.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. weekdays, closed on Memorial Day. Meals will be available for pickup for children ages 18 and under. Meals include lunch for the day and breakfast for the following day for each child, just as before. <clears throat> I'm establishing a district leadership team to consider safety, procedures, learning, relationships with community organizations and families, and social emo emotional wellness in planning to reopen Greendale schools for the 2020-2021 school year. Administrators are collecting interest from teachers and support staff to identify representatives to be part of the team. Resources and information from the Greendale Health Department and other local state and national officials will be used to develop the plan to prevent instruction in our buildings and keep students and the community healthy and safe. Graduation is scheduled for Saturday, July 18th. The time and format are yet to be determined. When the guidelines for public gatherings are updated, we will have a better idea if we should start planning for a traditional graduation ceremony or for an alternative format, which will still allow every student to cross the stage. A new student board representative, Paris Wooden, was recently chosen by the interview team to fill the seat vacated by graduating senior Emma Bodie. A new student board representative, Axel Semide, will replace Megan Jacobs, whose family has moved. The board will welcome both students by the August 3rd board meeting. I participated in a conversation with Mrs. Derrick, Ms. Marriott, and Ms. Knox. I appreciate their genuine engagement and the opportunity to repair the harm caused by the district. I would like to again offer my sincere apology to Ms. Knox for the trauma caused by the administrative response, and I encourage students to advocate for themselves when they believe an injustice has occurred. 
I continue to commit to addressing racism and bias in the Greendale schools. We will be working together to continue to advance the goals in the Welcoming Diversity Action Plan and efforts to move equity work forward. Following three rounds of interviews involving staff and parents, as well as extensive reference checks on the final candidates, I made an offer to the preferred candidate for the Director of Equity and Instruction position. A detailed announcement will be released tomorrow. And finally, I was notified that the Village Board has trustees not able to attend a joint meeting on May 26th. I am working with the village manager, Todd Michaels, to identify another date and will inform the board soon. That concludes my communications. All right, thank you for sharing, Kim. Any additional communication from the board? All right, then we will have the public comment section of our, our meeting. And I think, uh, Kim, you'll be uh, sharing any comments that have been received by the district. That's correct. So the first comment is from Laura Miller representing Paige. Joe, you should really have participated in the book club discussion of Biased by Jennifer L. Eberhart, not only at this past meeting, but over the past year. I have been to every board meeting except four since September 18th, and know you said a comment or two about the beginning chapters, but we wanted to hear your thoughts and see a transformation within you throughout the 10 months you have been reading this book. With your silence, we, left, we are left to guess. Did he read it? Did he understand the extremely important subject matter that was being discussed? Did he learn anything about himself or the community we all share? We know that racial bias is an extremely uncomfortable subject to dissect, but as the leader of the school board, you needed to do your best to embrace this topic. And as the leader, you should have spoken up and acknowledged the changes needed, that changes need to happen within yourself, the school district and the community. <clears throat> As for the others who actively participated in this book club, we really appreciate those who were brave enough to show us the profound shift this book has made on your perspective of what it means to live and navigate through a world full of bias. It is our sincere hope that its teachings will stay with you and you will strive to continue your education with regards to bias and equity. We hope that when you are faced with pushback, overt and covert racism, you will find the strength to stand for true justice you all have the power to decide how this will be handled in the future for our students. During this meeting, the budget will be discussed and there are many unknowns. We sincerely hope that within this budget cycle, the funding for equity work will remain in intact, if not bolstered. We have much work to do. And finally, we need to pay very close attention to our students with special needs and their families. We are struggling. I know that good plans may, many already be, may already be in the works, but two things are very clear. One, there needs to be more face-to-face -face internet engagement between teachers and or paras and their students with special needs. And the special education parents also ask to please be consulted, included in the planning process. We can help. And two, the school district needs to help facilitate an optional social time for students with special needs in an online platform, preferably twice weekly. Parents and students with special needs feel most strongly about this some administrators have been contacted about this, but thus far it has been denied because privacy is a concern. We ask you to reconsider this as other districts have been able to do online live class meetings with their special education students with parental consent. If consent is obtained by the family agreeing to this optional social engagement time, then there should be no problem. Please consider doing this as soon as possible. The need is real and immediate. The next comment is from Holly Curtis, identified as the co-founder of The Voice. Inclusion, the act of including or being included with a group or a community. Equity, the quality of being fair and impartial. If we put them together, we have seeking to ensure fair treatment by building a culture of belonging, by actively inviting all people within a community to attend all meetings and other gatherings, and also making those feel like they belong. In a, real world, this would reign true. In a real world, there would be no racism and no hate, no bullying, but this is not a reality and it's just pure fantasy. We have asked over and over again for fairness, equity, and inclusion. We've received only partial treatment from the district and by other groups stating they are for diversity. The district wants all people to be treated fairly and for Greendale to be a place where families of all backgrounds feel welcome. Unfortunately, this is far from the truth when it comes to this place. There's still struggles within our community especially when it comes to acceptance. 
some residents within our community have tried to join closed sessions and committees and fail, and fail without an explanation. Sometimes people in this community make you work hard to join a group or a meeting. You have to look under the racks, bridges, and jump through the hoops to be a part of something. Sometimes you have to join a group online and go through a series of questions and they will think about letting you in. These groups hold passwords and meeting information they have to say if you can gain access to the meetings. These meetings are about our children and we are allowing them to have control over those closed sessions. Then there's closed sessions happening behind closed doors as though there's a secret society making decisions without residents knowing. Residents are being asked quietly to join a meeting and are told to not reveal to their neighbor what was said, yet the district is for welcoming all, or are they? As the voice states, we are for inclusion and equity. We aren't for closed sessions and secrets. We aren't here for a popularity contest. We are here for those who don't have a voice. Our page on social media is wide open. We hide nothing. We still ask for the district to add African-American studies to the curriculum. We are also asking for closed sessions to stop and for other groups to stop holding on to passwords and meeting entry, especially when you say you are for the people and inclusion and equity. We ask the district to take control of this ongoing problem with groups and take back the residents' rights to attend meetings and giving the residents an easy way to obtain a password without begging for the information. This will stop the hidden agendas by groups. If you have the ability to work with committees, then you have the ability to make sure all residents can attend meetings with ease. No one should have to join a group or check a group's page for meeting information. The district has a social media page, a website, and communication on director who residents can get in contact with. The city of Greendale has social media page and website. This is where all meeting and committee information should be posted instead of putting the information in the hands of groups. Be fair, be kind, and do the right thing for our residents. The next comment is from Mary Grogan. As of Monday, May 18th, former Superintendent Gary Kiltz's license, superintendent license, administrator license, director of instruction license, principal license, teaching license, alternative education license, and political science teaching license are all being investigated by the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction. Interested residents can Google DPI license lookup to verify this information for themselves. The fact that Greendale School Board President Joe Crepito and school board members Kathy Vincent, Noel Janish, and Thor Misko all voted to allow Gary to tiptoe out the back door after stealing approximately $10,000 of public tax dollars remains a sure sign that Greendale School Board is not operating transparently, honestly, or prudently under the leadership of Joe Crepito. Joe Crepito's school board seat is up for election in the spring of 2021. So is Kim Salem's interested candidates can pull papers from the district office in late December. If we want better board leadership, we need to elect better board representation. And the final comment is from Karen Dalkin. I'd like to say thank you to Jonathan Mitchell, business manager, Marquez Guzman, finance manager, and Kendall Schools Finance 101 via Zoom on Tuesday, May 5th, 2020. It was an enlightening 75 minute presentation describing the intricacies of what it takes to fund our school district. I was impressed with their team's expertise, experience and dedication to make a complex process look effortless. The budget process alone is a daunting task. I learned of the community's involvement to contribute to the process of balancing and prioritizing components of the budget to do what is best for the students while being mindful of taxes being paid by the community. I am grateful for what they do to keep the school district running smoothly. I encourage everyone to watch the rerun of the presentation that is available on YouTube. Thank you again to Jonathan Marquez and Kim for your presentation. And that concludes communicate the citizen comments. All right, thank you, Kim. Uh, continuing on with the agenda, first item on the agenda is approval of the board meeting minutes of last, our last meeting. So is there a motion to approve? I move approval of the board meeting minutes of the May 4th meeting as outlined in agenda item 1.1. 1. 1. Second. Is there a motion a second to approve the board meeting minutes of May 4th? Any further discussion? I like the new uh, format. Yep, so right. So uh, as Kim mentioned last uh, meeting, uh, it was a more condensed, concise uh, version um, with the uh, actual YouTube video or the actual video of the meeting 
um, uh, post as well. All right, so any further discussion? Otherwise, I'll call for a roll call vote, starting with you, Kim. Yes. Noel. Yes. Kathy. Yes. Thor. Yes. And I am yes, motion carries, thank you. Um, next, item is, um, next item on the agenda, the financial report. Uh, so this, or this month, uh, checks and disbursements, as well as an update from Jonathan. So included in the packets was the check register information, payroll, and credit card information for the month. Uh, the summary of revenue and expenditures was included. And so I would highlight the revenues for the current year of 62.27%. We took a look at some of the variance areas, just understanding that we're late in the financial year and trying to understand um, how close we are to budget. So a couple items on the revenue side, one was interest income. So uh, after we receive our property tax payments in January, we usually are in some of our higher um, cash flow months. And so this would be the time of year where we would be getting a larger amount of revenue um, from interest on our bank accounts. Uh, based on the COVID uh, pandemic, interest rates fell um, very quickly. And so right now we're at about half of what our budgeted amount would be. And in these next couple months, we don't believe that we would reach um, that budgeted area. So you see there's a variance of about $37,000 um, there, and we believe we'll come in um, below, below budget in that area. Another area that's impacted, so our other local sources. So we use the source codes in the 290s there. Uh, that's going to include some of our facility usage, pool, auditorium, um, and other areas. And right now we're about $88,000 below. Again, based on restrictions of using some of our facilities, we would anticipate that area coming in below budget, uh, an area where we were above budget um, was our other sources. So we used the source codes in the 900s. So there uh, we had a couple one-time items, including um, one of the items that was mentioned in public comment. There was a reimbursement of credit card charges that were personal in nature. Um, so that went into an other revenue um, category. Uh, so that, that line item is about $18,000 over budget. And so that will offset some of the areas in the 280s and 290s that are gonna be under budget um, right now. On the expenditure side, we're at 62.35% of the budget. Again, similar analysis that we're doing there. Uh, one of the areas is on overtime. Uh, so right now 21,000 versus what was budgeted. So that's gonna include overtime for special events, overtime for um, maintenance and taking care of facilities during the winter time. And uh, that's gonna get addressed in how we develop the budget for the 2021 year, that that's an area that just needs uh, um, additional um, dollars budgeted to it, um, that to provide those services we have to do to maintain our facilities, it needs to be a little bit larger budget overall um, for the, the district, but there's about a $9,000 variance. Right now, we're not impacting that area because with school out of session, we're not in the need um, for overtime to run special events. The, two, the 290 expense codes. So there we had a one-time cost that we will be reimbursed through a grant. And so that was a workforce development grant to provide some licensure for in the special education area to some of our staff members. So right now we're awaiting reimbursement on that. And so that will cover um, the variance that we see right now. Some areas that were under budget. So one is in travel. So that's our object code in the 340s. We've talked about the contracted pupil transportation. There's also our athletic transportation and staff travel for conferences has been greatly reduced um, during this time period. We're obviously not traveling out uh, across the area or state for conferences. Then in the 400s and 500s, so our 400 object codes are our non-capital equipment. So we think about supplies uh, and, and some of our other non-capitalized um, non equipment. So in that area, we've held back on our building budgets during this time. Uh, we've got less 
going on in the day to day in terms of materials that are being used. So that's an area that right now we're about $250,000 under budget. And then again, on the capital equipment side, about 160,000. And so in, in this time period, we would be getting to the end of the year and kind of identifying some priority needs. And based on the financial situation, we've really tried to hold that very tight and really prioritizing only those expenses that would relate directly to providing continuity with virtual instruction. And so that's why we see some larger variances there. And that would be those line item areas we would target when we're trying to look at where we may end up uh, under budget for this school year. So any questions on the financial report? Thank you for sharing that, Jonathan. I think that, that's nice to be able to take a look at the budget and current and, and share with us that, that variance. So at, to your point, because we are late in the fiscal year, you know, the fiscal year ends June 30th, um, are you forecasting that these variances are going to change much or um, is this kind of where you anticipate things uh, and then we'll just look to see um, prior to the end of the fiscal year? These would be the major areas I see the, the variances right now. We are going to talk about that a little bit in the preliminary budget discussion about trying to kind of consolidate those revenue and expense figures together to come up with how much we may end up in under budget. And I think it, um, forecasting that uh, in the presentation, we're talking about a two to three hundred thousand dollar figure if we were trying to today identify what we think we may end up under budget for the school year, and that's on a budget of um, over 30 million. All right. All right, so any questions for Jonathan? Otherwise, we, we need a motion to approve checks and disbursements for this month. I motion to approve uh, checks in the amount of two million five hundred forty nine thousand four hundred sixty six dollars sixty eight or eighty eight cents. Disbursements in the amount of one million six hundred fifty thousand six hundred thirty nine dollars and thirty two cents, for a total amount of four million two hundred thousand one hundred six dollars and twenty cents, as outlined in agenda item two point two. Is there a second? I second. There's been a motion and a second to improve checks and disbursements for the month, totaling $4,200,106.20. Any further discussion? All right, then I call for uh, roll call. Kim? Yes. Noel? Yes. Kathy? Yes. Thor? Yes. And I am yes, motion carries. Um, next item on the agenda. Uh, we have personnel. So we've got uh, approved personnel, uh, a teacher appointment, and um, accept the speech language pathologist resignation. So anything from administration um, to highlight there or to add? Seeing none, all right, then um, if there's any questions, if no, if no questions from the board, uh, looking for a motion to approve. Move approval of agenda item 4.1, approval of teacher appointment and acceptance of speech language pathologist resignation. Is there a second? Second. There's been a motion and a second to approve personnel as outlined in agenda item 4.1. Any further discussion? All right, then I call for a roll call vote. Kim? Yes. Noel? Yes. Kathy? Yes. Thor? Yes. And I am also, yes, motion carried. Um, next item on the agenda is the 2020-21 school lunch fees. So this is for the upcoming school year. Uh, we heard a report um, that talked a little bit about the need to uh, make some adjustments to that. So um, anything that administration wants to share or add? Yeah, so I'd just like to add something. So we took that information and, and discussion from the last time and just verified what the requirements are versus what was proposed. So the proposal was 
moving the elementary prices from $2.45 to $2.60, and at middle and high school from $2.90 to $3.10. And that's in alignment with where federal reimbursement rates are and what they're um, expected to be going forward. But we did have a question about what that minimum uh, would be in terms of price increase. So you'll see that there's two options below. Uh, before that, we provided comparative information of other school districts in the area. That was part of our conversation the last time. And then when we got to the recommendations uh, providing two different options. There's the proposal that we presented the last time, uh, again, at those amounts that I, I shared. Uh, but the minimum, the minimum we would be required to increase those prices to would be an elementary lunch price going from 245 to 255 and middle and high school lunch prices from 290 to three dollars. So we provided a, an analysis uh, doing some projections of meals that we serve right now to understand what that revenue difference would be. So under option one, it's about 15,500 in additional revenue under option two, about $8,800 in additional revenue. Uh, we can build the budget um, around either of those options. And as we shared um, here earlier this evening, we got an extension to run our uh, meal program through the end of June. Uh, based on that being reimbursable for all students, um, we believe that that may have a positive impact on how we end this current year financially um, and trying to maintain fund balance uh, for that food service fund. There'll be some expenditures that we'll have in terms of equipment with our, our new kitchens at the elementary level, um, but certainly um, the, the fact that we get reimbursed for all meals that we provide in that program, um, that we can uh, uh, make either of those two options work and certainly wanna be um, recognizing of the situation that our families may be in uh, financially going into the fall. Um, so we provide each of those two options and would be looking for board direction um, on which one you'd want to choose. Okay. Um, all right. So we are um, posted to approve today, but uh, like Jonathan said, there are a couple of options here to, to talk about the, the possibilities of increasing um, to 260 at the elementary level or to increase to 255. And then same thing at the secondary level, either to increase to 310 or to uh, bring it down to about $3. Um, a couple of things. Joe, your mic is really hard to hear tonight. Okay. I don't okay. aware of that. Um, I, I guess I would opt for option two, just given the whole COVID pandemic and the fact that families are struggling right now to begin with. I, I think, um, especially at the high school level, that um, the option one would be a dollar a week more per child. And I know it doesn't sound like a lot necessarily, but I think the impact to families um, might be more than they can handle right now. So I would, I guess I would say I'd be up for option two. I would be in agreement with Kathleen. I think the option two, given everything that's going on right now, and will probably linger in, definitely linger into the fall and into next year. I think option two is the best way for our families. I, I don't know if um, uh, Tim. I know that in your uh, section later there was um, a link to the Wisconsin. Um, data for, I, I forget the name of the survey, the survey. but uh, in that survey, one of the things that it talked about also is there's a large proportion of students across the state of Wisconsin that are, you know, curious and concerned about where they're going to get their next meal. Uh, it was 27%, I want to say it was. I don't know what our numbers are for Greendale, but um, I would assume that it's probably not, you know, it's not 1%, right? It's probably somewhat close to whatever that Wisconsin average is. And uh, when you think about Maslow's you know, hierarchy of needs, if a student doesn't feel safe or doesn't feel, um, doesn't have those basic needs, uh, there's not a lot of learning that happens. So I, I agree. I think, you know, if we can keep costs down uh, as much as possible here, and we're talking about, you know, less, what is it, $7,000 essentially sway, depending on how we do this in our budget from a revenue perspective, I would rather keep it at the minimum. Um, 
for this next year. And I'm in agreement with option two. Um, also, I think that that would be a better option for our families um, coming back after the um, COVID-19 pandemic and just um, seeing where everyone is um, financially after that. All right, can you hear me? All right, okay, can you hear me? Uh, Jonathan, if, if we do, it sounds like the majority um, are, are in favor of doing the option two. Um, what does that impact next year? Because every year we have to take a look and we have to see where we are at with our costs versus the, the, the what we're charging. Because I know at a federal level, the, the federal government wants to make sure that we're not having the free and reduced uh, lunches subsidizing the overall program um, to some extent. So how would this, if we would go with option two, how would that set us up for next year? So I think with option two, there's the real potential that there'll be a minimum increase again next year. Um, whereas option one, there may or may not be a year where you would have to take action. It's possible that next spring under option two will have will be required to increase five or 10 cents again, but that would be based on that price lunch equity tool. So it appears that if we go with option two, we could, um, uh, maybe stagger is, isn't the right word, but you know we could delay a little bit the increases or take those increases over two years rather than all at once. Yes. Okay. All right, any other further questions or, or comments? Is there anything else that we're missing in our logic or thoughts when we think about option two that we may wanna, and that we're overlooking maybe from option one from any of the administration's perspective? Well, and if I could just also dovetail off that and just say, you know, I was looking at the surrounding areas, the uh, different amounts, and we still fall above the mid, mid like midline of that. So, you know, I, I don't know what determines that in each district, but um, but I agree with, you know, what Thor asked. I don't, I don't believe there's anything significant that we're missing. I, uh, we can we can design the budget around either of those models. I think we just talked about one of the potentials is that this could look like a multiple year increase that would be kind of staggered. Um, so with that understanding, we're comfortable uh, managing the budget with either of these two options and certainly understand the logic of adapting to uh, what the community needs will be next year. Um, but I would, I would also add um, and just clarify um, as always that we don't prohibit anyone from eating because they have a negative lunch balance. We always let a child have a meal. Um, so we'll work with the families if there's a negative lunch balance, but we don't um, keep a kid from eating. And then Jonathan, as we look to budget, um, you know, we, we want this, we want the food services um, budget to be balanced if we would go with option two, would that still allow for wage increases to our staff or would that impact um, that at all for, for food service staff? Yeah, we're holding on any wage increases right now for the 2020-21 year. And I think we want to better understand the landscape of state revenues as it impacts our classroom staff um, and look at how we uh, manage all of those groups based on the revenues that will be available. And there's a, a current fund balance that must be used only for school lunches that would absorb potentially that uh, loss of revenue of about $7,000. Yes, that's accurate. Yeah, so I, I would uh, move approval of agenda item 4.2, option number two, which is increasing elementary lunch prices at the minimum rate from 245 to 255 and increasing middle and high school lunch prices, uh, the minimum rate from 290 to $3. Is there I a second? second? I second that. There's been a motion a second to approve um, school lunches. Um, any further discussion? Can I call for a roll call vote, Kim? Yes. Noelle? Yes. Kathy? Yes. Or? Yes. I have yes, motion carries.
Um, all right, thank you uh, for bringing that forward, Jonathan. And um, it, it will be one piece of our overall budget that we'll talk about tonight. Um, next item on the agenda is we are posted to approve our CISA one agreement. Um, so this is for the 2020-21 school year. Uh, this is where we purchase different services from uh, the CISA. Typically, these are services that as an individual district, we don't necessarily have the, the resources or the skills in-house. We use this consortium and, and purchase from CISA. Anything that uh, administration likes like to share about this? Yes, so the um, basic membership in the flat service fee is about $1,500. That is um, just to access the services that are provided by CISA. There are several networks in which we participate, um, job alike networks and specific topic areas. One area that I recommend for adjustment is the math leader network. Um, we're gonna reduce that to one seat as opposed to the five seats that we had this year. Um, and it will be rotated and shared with the person who attends the meetings. So that will come down about $1,480. Um, the lion's share or the largest portion of the CISA contract, as you look at the bottom line, are two seats for alternative placements for students with IEPs um, who require significant services that we can't provide in the district currently. And we continue to have that placement assigned in the IEPs for two students. So that is the bulk of the cost that you're seeing at the bottom. And it is really a special education expense. And that's the thing labeled turning point, is that correct? Yes. Turning okay. point is the name of an alternative program um, run by CESA, so they run a school. Okay. They run several schools, but Turning Point is the school that we have students enrolled in. Is that is that the only option that's available to meet the IEP? Is is that or is it? How does that work? Tim, can you speak to that? Yep, absolutely. Uh, Thor, there, there's there's a few other options out there. We are limited in terms of the placement options outside of the school district once we get to that point as an IEP team having that conversation. Um, and it is a pretty significant cost associated to it. Um, the Turning Point program um, is a quality program. Um, so part of it is you get what you pay for. Um, and we've had good success with that program in particular. So continuing with those seats um, is appropriate. Um, obviously, a main goal of us here is to educate all of our students within the district in their home schools, but at times the IEP team makes that determination that it's not appropriate to have them placed um, in our school district um, and parents are, are involved in that process as well. So um, it's, it's a very good option for us in terms of placing students. And is it, oh, go ahead, Thor. On that same note, is it something that we only get access through CISA or is it actually a program? I'm just curious, is CISA like a pass through for that or is that, are they actually running or facilitating that program? The, C, the, pro, the school is run by CISA. Run by, okay. Correct, yeah. That is, um, that is all the cost of the school. So it's, it's not a pass through, they actually are the ones running the school. As far as that 77,000, does that include transportation or is transportation an additional cost with that? Transportation is an additional cost to that, that tuition fee. Okay. Well, th these are just the costs associated with CESA. So on an annual basis, um, as Kim mentioned, you know, we, we, we join, so there's a membership and, and a flat service fee to all the districts that are part of CESA. And then in addition, um, what part of the, the packet is we see exactly what additional services uh, we're using either for professional development and our staff or for students, people. I, I did have another question. It's not a big item on there, but uh, the $2,000 for the Parents United Consortium, um, could you explain what that is? Is that, do we have parents in our district that are part of that or is that just through CESA? That's a program through CESA where by paying um, that $2,000 um, cost, it allows um, parents and members of the Greendale community to access programs which are put on 
by that Parents United Consortium. So they may be programs related to um, students with disabilities and self-advocacy or life for students after they graduate high school, what do the legal processes look like? Um, so there's a whole wide range of resources and presentations that they provide. And we push out that information. Kitty does a great job of making sure that that information is updated to our families so that they have access to what the Parents United calendar is. Um, but without paying that $2,000 fee, we don't have access for our families to go and attend those, those mm -hmm. meetings. So and that, that's outside of our parent, um, we have parent network here within Greendale, right? So this is an additional opportunity then? Correct. Yep. It's through CESA 1. So it's that Southeast area um, where there's different network meetings that they provide. A lot of times they bring in outside speakers to address particular areas um, that there's interest in. Um, and by, by paying this cost, we have access to those okay. presentations. Great. Right. Thank they you. Take a, they do take a, attendance at those meetings and the decision that we made to I recommend continuing that is based on the amount of participation of Greendale families in the programs offered through Parents United. All right, great. It, quick question on services for this year. So were there services that were postponed or, or returned from CISA that they weren't able to fulfill based upon all the things that are different right now? So the educational audiologist, the speech and language pathologist and turning point would be the services that um, are separate. And at this time, they are continuing to deliver services. Is that correct, Tim? Yep, you are You are correct. They're, they're doing similar to what we're doing and providing services in that virtual environment. Okay. Does, C, does CISA, I mean, I, I don't think this is necessary for this year, but it would be interesting do they provide kind of an ROI, you know, kind of value proposition when they talk about the things that they're doing here? For example, you know, we're putting um, essentially $100,000 into CISA 1, and what's our return on that investment? And I know we can look at the numbers and say we have this access, for example, to Turning Point, which is a large, you know, a, a large portion of that. But there's a lot of grant that they facilitate and provide access to that perhaps maybe we wouldn't get access to. So there, you know, for example, Carl Perkins, I don't know what or how we use them to access Carl Perkins funding. Um, but I'm, I'm just curious, like if they have like a, you know, like for every dollar you spend with CISA, your district <laughs> you know, saves seven or something like, is that, um, is that out there? Do they share that? And if they don't, we should maybe, we should recommend that to them, whoever's our CISA delegate. <laughs> Yes, our, was, who is our, our funding is through the Southwest School to Work Consortium. So that is not um, through CISA. That is through five districts that we work with. And you will um, see the Carl Perkins Consortium Agreement come through later this summer. Um, however, we do have access to other grants. So we um, participated and received a mentoring grant uh, through CISA, through our work with them. Um, and there's some other grants that we had. The, again, the lion's share of this is for specific direct services to students with IEPs that um, we determine through an IEP process is the, the most cost-effective way to serve the needs of the students and the most appropriate um, education for those students. And so we can certainly evaluate other programs um, and we can also absolutely have a conversation with CISA about return on investment. I participate in the professional advisory committee um, twice per month, and that's no charge. Um, so I can certainly recommend through that group um, that we that they consider offering a return on investment as we bring their contract forward to boards for approval um, to show the value of the CISA membership. Yeah, that's a good point. Who is our CISA liaison again? I, I am the CISA liaison and we have our, the annual meeting is tomorrow. So um, once I start to get acquainted with that, I can certainly make the same recommendation that Kim will about giving a return on our investment. I know that they do a general overview of here's what we've done for the year, but it's more to all of the CISA delegates and the, and the districts that are participating rather than a one-on-one -on -one with each district. All right, then uh, I'll ask for a motion to approve our CISA 1 agreement for the upcoming school year. 
I motion to approve the CISA agreement, CISA number one agreement as outlined in agenda item 4.3. Is there a second? I second. Is there a motion and a second to approve the 2020-2021 CISA one agreement? Any further discussion? All right, I'll call for a roll call vote, Kim? Yes. Noel? Yes. Kathy? Yes. Or? Yes. And I am yes, motion carries. Uh, moving on to new business on the agenda. Um, we're bringing back for information the uh, proposed 2020-2021 budget. Jonathan. So I'm gonna share my screen. Hopefully you can all see that. So we are here to talk about the 2020-21 preliminary budget. So where we are, um, this has been particularly challenging um, to navigate how to plan for this budget based on changing circumstances. And so that's a reality. We're all living in our daily lives and, and things changing. Um, so we're gonna talk through how we're trying to best position the district and analyzing different scenarios so that we understand how we can provide great programming for kids, um, even as all of this information continues to change and, and the state will be challenged um, in terms of their uh, ability to pay um, for K-12 education as well as other services. So our agenda um, we're hitting on four items this evening. Again, revisiting our budgetary principles, so our, our guiding values, the process and the communication plan, the development, and then um, the impact on budget development of the current pandemic. So our budgeting values, we always start conversations with these, our 10 priorities. Again, very purposefully, we're um, working to be proactive, positive, and put students first. And that's a driver in how we're thinking about this. Um, so here's the, those first five. Um, uh, going to the next slide, um, the, the rest, I'm thinking about equality and equity and how resources are allocated. There was a comment this evening about the investment um, in equity and, and the resources that were allocated in last year's budget um, for our coalition locally. Those resources are again allocated in the preliminary budget here. Uh, some key key points. Um, we have to think about sustaining in the long term, um, even though we're going to have some short term challenges. And then we want to be very transparent about the budgeting process. Um, we also need to be utilizing possibilities thinking. Uh, and our local committees that have been talking about this have been engaging in those conversations of thinking outside the box as we're adapting how we can be responsible with that budget. We come back to our overall picture of the four steps of the process. We are really in step number four, refining the budget at this stage, but we know as information changes regarding our revenue projections that we can jump into these other steps and we may have to go back to step number two and revisit that revenue allocation and kind of understand how that impacts the prioritization of investments. So I think we'll underline that, underscore that this evening of how we think we may, we may do that. Step four here, the, the months of May and June, getting to that preliminary budget approval and then working towards October 15th, which is our final budget. We believe in that, that time span from this evening until October, that five month span, that there'll be a lot more information that we will receive from the state that'll give us a much better picture of what the year is gonna look like. Um, but we're trying to put a plan in place now so that we're prepared um, as that information changes. We've provided links to the internal and external budgetary review steps. So in the month of April, doing some work in terms of the alignment of our long range plans. So thinking about, um, for instance, our technology department, um, we've had the institution of our fiber network this year. And now next year, looking at 
um, the replacement of some of our network hardware equipment and how that fits in with our annual budgeting um, and how we may be able to align that strategically in a way to create budgetary capacity um, now that we've got the fiber line online um, and utilizing those federal dollars as best as possible. So we've been having discussions, whether it's technology or curriculum or other, other areas, auditorium, athletics, what are some of our longer term goals and how are we making sure that we're moving resources around those, or at least that we understand what some of those key investments need to be. So as we need to pivot with the budget, uh, we understand those priorities. So here this evening is the presentation of the preliminary budget. We will be bringing this back for action in mid-June um, with some additional information at that time. External review steps. So we said we want to be transparent and we also want to engage the community in conversation. So that comes from both our community finance team as well as um, our business um, team uh, within the, the district. We've got some district staff members that are helping to take a look. We've done a presentation on School Finance 101 um, and uh, had the ability to engage with the community around uh, what we're doing with school financing, allow them to ask questions and hear this evening that presentation of the preliminary budget. As we go into this next year with some uncertainty, we've talked about some of the priorities and commitments we're making as a district. So the key piece is caring for that social emotional wellness of staff and students. And the priority being to avoid any layoffs. Uh, we don't have full control over that state budgeting process but we know that that's a priority is taking care of the people within our organization as best we can. Um, we have a commitment to the teacher salary structure, but any salary increases for all staff in the district are on hold right now until more information is known about next year's budget. Um, we are working with staff and doing possibilities thinking on savings and alternative revenues, and we're providing consistent and frequent communication so that we can keep all stakeholders informed. Some of the known pieces, we're going to receive the state aid for this current 1920 school year. So those dollars that we have budgeted for revenues, we will receive. At the federal level, we know in addition to our normal title allocation for a year, there is an additional one-time allocation through the CARES Act of 270 to 285 thousand dollars, the details of how those dollars can be spent, and over what time period those are intended for, we're still going to receive additional information. We get that through the school DPI, and so we've got our school finance um, FAQs where we've been tracking that information. We know at the state level, the budgetary outlook earlier in 2020 was strong. We had a presentation earlier in January, February about the state of the district's fund balance or rainy day fund. At that time, there was a high reserve, but there have been significant shortfalls um, in tax revenues that we anticipate are gonna exceed those reserves. Um, the governor has asked for staff in the K-12 arena to continue to be paid for their regular hours. Um, the vast majority of all of our staff members have been, been engaging either in virtual learning, we're running our meal program for students, we've been running childcare for essential workers. We've found a lot of ways to support our community um, and we have continued to pay staff within the dollars that we have allocated in this year's budget. We've kept track at that state level because we know a large portion of revenues are coming from income tax and sales tax. And so the government shutdown will have um, an impact on those receipts. And so we've anticipated um, what will happen. So back in March, we talked about the budgeting work we were doing under the current law um, prior to the pandemic. And so there we had uh, revenues anticipated of $33,245,654. And you see there, 
um, anticipated revenue limit increase with both additional membership, we're growing in the number of students that we have, as well as the amount that we were receiving per student. So that $179 per student is in state law right now. Um, and that would be something the legislature will have to address if they don't believe they'll have the revenues um, in order to cover that. Uh, there was anticipated per pupil increase, and that's just based off of additional membership of students. Um, then the last piece, based on the fact that we've had growing resident enrollment at a very fast clip the last couple of years, there would be fewer open enrollment seats available next year as we maintain our class size targets. On the expenditure side, this is uh, looking at the projection back in March. Um, we had budgeted and looked at what salary increases would be, looking at a 5% health insurance increase, um, assigning dollars for potential open enrollment students going out of the district as we've got growth in the community of students, new students and families coming in, um, the possibility that there could be some of those that would choose open enrollment programming out of the district. Uh, our OPEB trust payments, identifying dollars there to make sure that we um, are sufficiently covering um, upcoming payments that we may have for our Fund 73. So we've got a slide later on the presentation to go over current balance levels um, there. Staffing modification. So we um, targeted in particular a lot of conversation around pupil services needs and made some modifications to staffing where there were some offsetting expenditure um, decreases. So either based on um, student programming numbers, number of IEPs um, at certain buildings that we were able to move um, dollars around. But in particular, we saw recurring themes prior to the current pandemic of some uh, needs for pupil services staffing. And as we move into this fall, we believe that that will be um, particularly important as our students try and uh, work towards adapting back to that, that school environment. Private school voucher increases. So within our forecasting model, we see that increasing about $52,000. We would receive additional revenue limit for whatever that voucher increase amount is. We will not know that exact dollar figure until October. And then it essentially becomes a pass through tax that the district um, puts on the school district tax levy. Utilities, electricity and gas. So we have some estimate um, there in terms of additional square footage that we're adding to four of our buildings that we're accounting for the fact that there'll be additional utility costs. Um, our marching band program. So we've had a very expansive summer school programming there. And so some offsetting expenditures related to that marching um, band program. And then our pupil transportation contract, there's a contracted two and a half percent increase for the next year, which will be the fifth year of our five year agreement. So then um, once we hit our, um, our, our March timeline, we had to begin considering the landscape of how things were changing and the impact that revenue loss will have on the ability of state to move forward with funding of schools into the 2021 year. And so we've been working to understand what kind of modeling to use to prepare for that situation. And so you'll see on this slide, there's a lot here um, to underscore that there are a number of models that we're looking at. Uh, we believe that there will be some impact to revenue, um, but it's difficult to um, have a crystal ball to know exactly um, what will happen because uh, there's a, a significant delay in getting information that really will give the state an accurate picture of the, the impact of the pandemic. So you'll see in the modeling scenarios one and two, 
we take a look at some scenarios that look very close to a statewide freeze in funding. So instead of providing increases in year two of the state biennium, um, looking at a situation where they may be trying to just sustain what they've provided in the 2019-20 school year, um, and maybe some minor modifications from those figures. We've also looked at some larger uh, models. The governor provided a $2 billion figure um, in communications regarding potential loss at the state level. There we took a per student basis across the state and estimated that that could have an impact of about 1.58 million. We considered a scenario that would be similar um, to the changes that happened in the last uh, financial recession where there was a five and a half percent revenue limit reduction. And then even beyond that, uh, understanding the magnitude of unemployment and the disruption to the economy looked at scenarios that would go even deeper than, than that. Um, so uh, we just underscore that there, there is this range um, of the, the discussion. And I think on the upcoming slide, we're gonna talk about um, focusing in kind of between that modeling scenario two and three right now, but we've tried to grasp what it could mean under a number of, of scenarios. So when we built this preliminary budget, the challenge there is which of those scenarios to use. Um, where we are tonight in the, the budget that was provided to the board, uh, we modeled at a $0 per pupil revenue limit increase. So that would be as if there was a change to law um, from the 179. We also utilized the 26% reimbursement percentage for special education aid. State law says that this is good, that needs to go to 30% for the second year of the biennium. And we also factored in a 50% reduction in summer school enrollment for the summer of 2020. Um, that would also flow into our revenue limit for next year. And we believe that the movement there to go online will have some impact um, on our families participating in that. Um, particularly, we may see that a little more at the elementary levels. Um, and we do anticipate a budget repair bill. Um, so that's the legislative action that would have to happen for those things, um, the first and second points I have there to change uh, for pu per pupil and for special education aid. But when we do those calculations, we come up with fund 10 revenues and expenditures of $32,550,339. So the budget presented is in balance based on those factors. Jonathan, do you have any idea um, when they might be um, looking at this budget repair bill? Like what time frame they're looking at for that? So the most recent information I've heard is that mid-August could be a realistic timeline to have a good sense of where revenues are going to land. There was an extension to state tax reporting and, and well, federal tax reporting, but for the state to understand that piece that that's going to go into summer. And so the, again, we're kind of in ranges, but the mid-August timeframe is what's been floated as having a good idea. And from there, it would just be whatever timing the legislature felt was appropriate to move, move forward on that. But um, it, it may be deep into summer before a lot of information is known. Okay, thank you. Yep. Other questions so far? Um, with that, uh, I'll let Kim touch base then on some of the work that we're doing to prepare um, for budget adjustments that we may be looking at under those different models. Yes, yeah, so one of the things that you saw is on hold are any salary increases. So we've frozen salaries. So that original projection is something that would not be um, that we would hold on and not consider or touch until after numbers are known. Um, so you have approved contracts that continue um, professional staff at the 1920 pay range. Then um, one of the things that we're looking at in the early 2000s, 
the Wisconsin retirement system was not funded completely. And so the decision was made at the state level to um, distribute that shortfall to all of the districts. And at that time, every district in the state had to pay a portion of what was owed to the Wisconsin retirement system. And Greendale took out a loan as almost every district in the state did to pay for that uh, retirement system cost. In March of this year, um, we are now able to prepay the remainder of that debt without penalty. So we currently owe 2.7 million on that debt that will that is um, proportioned over the next six years. And we have um, taxing authority that and that five that four hundred and eighty thousand dollars per year that we owe on that debt for the next six years um, is included in the revenue limit and is put into fund 38. So one of the things that we would like the board to consider is to use a portion of fund balance to prepay between one and six years of, um, of that debt that we owe on the Wisconsin retirement system. And in so doing, it would increase the revenue limit spending by $480,000 on um, our operational costs without with, and be sustainable. So if we were to take action to prepay uh, the 2021 uh, payment out of the 2019-2020 fiscal year, it would give us some operating room. Um, and as Jonathan talked about at the beginning, we're anticipating um, having a surplus at the end of the year of just under $200,000. So to prepay one year would um, give us, would require a small use of fund balance that we would be able to cover. Uh, in order for us to do that prepayment, the board would have to take action uh, to notify our lender that we are intending to prepay. And in order for that to have an impact on the 2021 budget, we would need to take action before June 1st so that the payment could be made by June 30th. So um, one of the things that we're recommending to an, in anticipating this is to consider our fund balance and to potentially hold a special meeting uh, next week to take action if we would like to prepay anywhere between one and six years. There is an advantage um, to prepaying it beyond the uh, taxing authority that allows us to spend that 480,000 on other costs. Um, and that is we get additional uh, revenue from the state based on spending in the 2019-2020 school year. So that's one option. Um, the second area that we're looking at is we currently have, uh, annually we plan for 200,000 on capital projects. Given the amount of work being done in the referendum, we could hold um, and not do any new capital projects in the 2021 budget, um, reducing our expenditures by 200,000. We are in the process of um, reviewing math curriculum for grades six through 12. Uh, we've been working with the textbook vendors and have the opportunity to um, reduce our cost on textbooks for 2021 by $80,000. And so that's one area that we're looking at uh, for possible reductions. We also, um, within the technology budget, we um, have a lease and fiber because we have that, that fiber, we could eliminate the additional service fee that we pay. We currently pay Time Warner for uh, internet access that is to for redundancy so that in the event that there's an outage on the fiber network, um, we would have a backup system within the schools. However, we could um, eliminate that backup plan. There is uh, anticipated within the, the near future, a redundancy happening from fiber coming from Waukesha. So we currently have fiber coming from Alverno and we'd have redundancy by having fiber come from Waukesha, but there would be a risk in reduce in that reduction that we could have an internet outage in our schools, but um, it may be a place where we can find savings. 
Um, oh, sorry, I jumped here. <laughs> um, we have some additional um, pieces here around high cost aid that we could get additional revenue of $40,000. That would be by the prepayment of the, um, the, the debt from Fund 38. That would give us additional revenue for the high cost aid. Um, and then workers' compensation, we're expecting a dividend of 20,000. So that would be a savings. And because we'll have a reduction in enrollment and we're moving online, there's also reduced cost associated with summer school. Finally, um, one of the things that we can consider is we can review our enrollment projections um, in June. And if in fact we have space available, we could extend new open enrollment seats uh, in the month of July and generate additional revenue through open enrollment. So we have some uh, um, areas that are under consideration um, and all of these things would allow us to have, to hold back money in reserve because as Jonathan said, it's not until August that we're anticipating that the legislature would take action. And so we have a lot of unknowns and we are, um, our, the proposed budget that you are seeing tonight is definitely um, not a worst case scenario budget, but holding on some of these things and taking action on prepayment of debt would afford us the space to be able to cut more significantly in the event that those revenue shortfalls come to fruition that we were looking at in our um, more significant scenarios. For that prepayment of debt, Kim, Mm -hmm. You said you said that we could prepay anywhere between one year and six years because six I think six years is what's remaining. The four hundred eighty thousand dollars savings on line one, and then the additional forty thousand dollars savings um, where you talk about high cost aid. How much that savings there is based on how many years of prepayment? So uh, just to provide one clarification there, high cost aid um, has to do with some of our students with special needs that have one-to-one -one programming. And so there's been some strategies that we've used to maximize those dollars for reimbursement. And we recently completed our costing for the 1819 school year. So in the fall next year, we'll be completing it for 1920. Um, this will, the, what we looked at will impact both years is that based on um, those strategies that we came in about $40,000 higher um, in that area and we project that to continue into next year so we could provide some uh, additional revenue um, in, in that area. The fund 38 debt, we've got a slide up ahead. Um, we can talk about that a little bit further. Okay. Thanks, Jonathan. So I think then um, just the health insurance renewal, we've had it come in a lot higher than what was projected. So our expenditures through March of 2020 are about 109% or almost 110% of the premiums. So when we're starting to look at early renewal rates um, those are coming in high and well above the 5% that we've budgeted. So one of the conversations with the budgeting team is investigating those renewal options and what next steps might look like there, kind of laying out uh, multiple options and trying to negotiate the, the best rate while maintaining um, quality um, healthcare plan for the, the district. And then in terms of budgeting outlook, looking at um, current fund balance. Um, so that was brought up the 7.3 million. So considering that um, versus any short term um, shortfall impact uh, at the federal level, we know that there are the revenues coming from the CARES Act. There was the passage of the HEROES Act last week, Friday. Um, we're not, it's not clear that that will um, be taken up or or voted on in the Senate, uh, whether or not that will come to be, that had a significant amount of money for state and local governments to continue sustaining um, police, fire, local services, K-12 education. Um, and so more is to come in that area. Uh, we're analyzing that savings from distance learning. So I think when you looked at our monthly financial report, we were taking a look at 
um, those savings areas in the non-capital and capital object areas and where that may land, the transportation costs, um, where that will land in total. We're trying to analyze that and project out our last couple months. We do know state aid is going to be paid in the 1920 year, but next year um, is unclear. And then we're continuing to work on that in a, in a proactive manner. So I said we'd come back to Fund 73. So there's where we have post-employment benefits for staff members that accrued those um, in the time period of Act 10. That is no longer a benefit that new staff members in the district have access to. Um, but in terms of current commitments, there's about $1.9 million. And coming into this year, we had a balance of 352000 I know that this has come up in some of our recent updates on the budget. And so I wanted to provide some history here. Um, in the 14, 15 year and 2015, um, 16, there was some very targeted work of building up that balance to cover um, those needs. And um, in the last three years, um, the contributions have been um, pretty minimal based on the budgeting uh, of those dollars into other areas. And so that balance went down from 868,000 to 352 um, at the beginning of the 1920 year. So about half a million dollars. Uh, we have budgeted 237,000 um, this year. That's in excess of what is expected to be paid out. So we have 65,000 listed there. That's the projected withdrawals. So we'd be adding, you can kind of do the, the math, math there, um, about $170,000 to get to um, an updated um, balance at the end of this year. And so looking at that, that I know that's a focus area because there is that um, unfunded liability amount. Um, we want to make sure that we've got dollars set aside to continue to, to pay for that. And Jonathan, what in the preliminary budget that you're sharing for 2020, 2021, what, what are the contributions that are being assumed for the, the 2020, 2021 budget? Yep, so um, we would have about $300,000 that we would be putting in as contributions for the 2021 budget. So again, um, even higher than that, that current 1920 amount um, in terms of making that a focus to build in that, that balance. Jonathan, what is our current unfunded liability? So of the, the current employees who are eligible for this benefit, um, which are any employees who qualified as of June 2011. Um, what is the number? Do you have that available? So um, roughly there's 1.9 million in liability. And so if you subtract out what well, we started with a, a balance of dollars that were prepaid, the 352, um, we know that there's about 1.6 million in um, expected expenses um, beyond what what we've set aside. So that would be what I would call the unfunded portion. It's about 1.6 million coming into this year. Thank you. So Kim led in on uh, this area in terms of the debt service um, funds. So the 2.765 million for Wisconsin retirement. Um, our goal this evening was just to provide multiple options and hear from the board about what the preference may be of exploring um, any of these um, items. The, the debt can be prepaid in $5,000 increments. So there could be an option that's somewhere in the middle of, of these items that are presented, um, but this is designed to provide discussion um, this evening uh, for potential action later on. Again, the, the piece that came up was this debt is callable, so it can be prepaid. We have to provide that 30-day notice. So option one, uh, considering kind of that lower end, is just targeting any dollars that we would underspend um, for um, the current year. And so there we've talked about that number of two to 300,000. And so if we have 
an estimated tax levy next year at 480, you could target it to um, that that levy to reduce that in the 2021 school year. Um, so it assumes that we would end the year under budget and this scenario wouldn't involve committing any fund balance dollars, just be trying to reutilize those dollars that we would underspend um, to pay down that debt. A second option would be targeting just that specific one year debt levy um, for the 2020-21 school year of 481,000. That would be the principal and interest payments that would be levied. Um, this would um, not impact the ability to short term borrow. Um, and a portion of this could be funded through an underspend in 1920. And I think um, Kim might have mentioned that, that you could split if we're going to end the year two to three hundred thousand dollars under budget, you could then identify um, some fund balance dollars to, to do that and try and target a one year um, impact on that, that debt levy. Um, another item that came up is kind of what would that dollar figure be in terms of the cushion that we have before we get to impacting the need for short-term borrowing. So the district has avoided um, short-term borrowing for a number of years. So as our bills are coming up, we're able to continue to pay those even during our low revenue months. So that particularly hits us in that October, early November time period before we get our larger state aid payments in December and property taxes in January. So a third model is looking at a target of about 900,000. When we take a look at our cash flow um, during the year, we know our our low point is about 900,000. Um, so we could utilize that as a target figure. Um, here we've looked at the debt commitments for the 2021 and 21, 22 years. And so that um, dollar figure could be um, targeted for both of those to pay the majority of those, those debt uh, payments and provide capacity within the revenue limit for those two years. And so the fourth option would be looking at the full payment of that Wisconsin retirement debt balance. So 2.765 million. If you were looking at just prepaying the entire debt, um, that would eliminate all payments through 2028. 26, or, or, I'm sorry, 2026, there's six years remaining. So some considerations on prepaying that fund 38 interest is that there's a difference between the debt interest payments that we will pay and what we can receive now out in the market on interest revenue. So you think about like paying a mortgage versus having money in a savings account. There's a difference um, right now because our debt is going to be two to three percent, depending on what year you look at. Um, in the near term, we know our interest revenues are going to be about a quarter of a percent. So we highlighted that earlier on the monthly financial. It's going to be low. Um, you may look at the current environment and say that it will improve um, in the near term and may expect that savings interest rates will go up. Um, when we look back at the prior um, financial recession, we know that took multiple years to happen. So in the near term, we know those will be lower. Uh, any prepayment can create some capacity for a revenue limit. Um, and if we are hitting multiple years with that, that can be done in a sustainable manner. Uh, the other item is, is that spending that's done in our debt service fund as a prepayment of that debt will be aidable in the following year. And so it's a little bit, because school funding is a little bit complex, uh, this is um, challenging, but uh, to, to see the full picture, but when the district spends dollars on educational, or in this case, it's debt spending under the revenue limit, we, um, based on our situation within the formula, we could get about 11% of additional state aid for prepayment the year after that's done. So when we talked about the timeline being 30 days, 
it could be done before this fiscal year would be over and it would have an impact next year. So an increase, it would not increase our revenue limit, but that could have some impact on the tax levy next year because we and so uh, one of the questions that we um, thought about, I thought about was the, what the recommendation would be. And so the biggest piece that we've been trying to consider is that any utilization of fund balance should really be thinking about sustainability. So we aren't trying to target fund balance to solve one year um, of problems and then creating additional challenges for future years. Our budgetary principles think about programming that can be sustained in the long term. Here, the, the district is close to the end of um, paying off that debt savings that I think there's some consideration to making a larger um, investment to prepaying that, that debt to try and have that impact to be sustainable over those six remaining years and then into the future. Um, that way, there's that ability to maximize some of the savings from debt interest. Um, educational programming can be sustained if we know those revenue limit dollars are impacted um, over the long term. Um, there's also that positive aid impact that I, that I described that would be on a one-time basis. So the current fund balance is about 23% of expenditures. The exact amount is 22.78%. Um, the recommendation to consider is that the board policy um, sets a minimum of 15%. Um, if there's any decision to go below that 15% figure, there does require two thirds of a board vote. So the board's allowed to do it, but it requires that vote. Um, took into consideration that that's intentional to have that 15% threshold and it says in policy that's being done to um, limit the amount of short term borrowing. Um, so the district could invest about $2.4 million towards prepaying the debt across all six years of those remaining debt payments. Um, if you if the board did shared for those those six years, um, but this would be a way to create that capacity. Um, again, this is for this is for discussion as an option. Um, but the key piece is thinking about how any investment that would be done could be sustained in that long term. And really, the recommendation is coming from the spot that we're looking at the financial landscape that the state has and realizing that there's gonna be some near-term challenges for the state to fund education. And so strategically trying to offer alternatives that the board has to sustain the programming um, that we have right now. Um, so the example, uh, the last piece here, the example of that debt interest cost for the 2021 calendar year, there would be about $71,000 in debt interest cost the first thing to consider if there was a larger expenditure of fund balances that would start incurring a need for short-term borrowing. Um, right now, we've looked at an average over the last five years. It's about 1.6% um, with fees and interest to do that. If we were at 1.5 million in borrowing, that would be about $24,000 and then would need to be built into the budget until the point where fund balance was built up again. So with that, we've got multiple options here and open to questions the board would have. So Jonathan, just to um, reiterate that. So the if we would go down to the 15%, we'd have approximately 1.5 million in potential borrowing needs. Yes, for this we, next year, for short-term borrowing, which would be, the, and that's where I think you had about $24,000 in expenses. So the savings on just the um, interest side is about 47, if you look at that last slide. Is that, am I reading that right? So 71 minus the 24. So 47, 398. Correct. Correct. Yep, so that would be a savings that you would have that would essentially be dollars that could be put back into and, programming under the revenue limit. 
And that's in addition to obviously the 480,000 that would be freed up from the, you know, essentially hold for the payment. I'm sorry, not, was it, uh, how much was it again? 480, Four, that's correct. Yeah, 480, okay. So it's in addition, so you'd have $480,000 in, in, in freed up money, if you will, that was currently being allocated for this, plus you'd have the additional $47,000 uh, more based upon just the way our you know, debt would work um, for us versus against us. But clarify that you would have 480,000 in revenue limit. And from those $480,000 that you freed up, you would have to commit to that 24,000 for short-term borrowing, but it would be less than what you would have committed in debt interest costs. So on that 480, you would have spent 70,000 in interest and instead you'd be spending about 24,000. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And so it's just a revenue limit, um, the 480 piece. And and we would have had to pay a minimum of about 300,000 though, if we would have just to meet our liabilities. So there's a, we basically would have had a, we would have had to have held three hundred thousand dollars approximately in our budget to pay our our uh, fund thirty eight debt. We we have four hundred and eighty one thousand built in next year to pay the principal and interest, and that that seventy one thousand listed there is the the interest okay. that's part of okay. that. So that's what's allocated right now for next year. Okay. And then are there options for, you know, as we're thinking about this as an option, how do we get our fund balance? You know, let's just, let's assume we move forward with this option. Um, how do we get out of the short-term borrowing swing every year um, as we look forward? And I know that, you know, next year is not going to be the only answer, but we're going to have to start to think about how do we start to build that back up? Yeah, so that would be targeted work, I believe, over a three to five year time period, uh, particularly at year end, um, focusing on that and coming back to the fact that revenue limit was created on that sustainable basis. So if the district is getting to a spot where we're under budget, um, that we would be intentionally trying to hold those dollars in order to build that fund balance back up. Um, but on the front end, that there was flexibility in, in dollars to have that, that programming be sustainable to maybe make some of these conversations, um, challenging conversations up ahead a little bit easier to navigate. And so what similar, to, so similar to Jonathan, how you started the meeting is you said, you know, you and Kim shared that preliminarily we looked to be coming out with the 2019, 2020 budget with X dollar amount unspent. And then at this point, we could then say, okay, rather than allocating it to other areas, we want to earmark it to grow the fund balance. Um, so it, it may not be something that we would budget for at the beginning of the process, but in the early spring every year, we could then look and decide that, okay, now that we know that where the numbers are going to be forecasted, mm -hmm. we could then earmark a portion of it to grow that fund balance. That's how I understand it. Yes, and you could also do a combination of uh, the option of, Jonathan, can you go to option three? So you could take a look at option three. And if you were to do that by the end of, by, um, in time to make that payment in 2019, 2020, then you would get, um, you would not be committing to short-term borrowing um, and there would be a revenue bump of 11% or just about $99,000 in aidable um, costs for next year. And then if you wanted some more time to consider taking us down to the 15% fund balance and determining short-term borrowing, you could choose to do that sometime during the 2020-2021 school year and then commit to short-term borrowing at that time. So you could essentially take a combination of um, option three and option four um, and, and build your way into it. 
but again, there's interest costs that are associated with not prepaying um, that are more than the interest we'll be making on keeping the money in the bank um, for short-term borrowing. Jonathan, um, by doing any of the options, but particularly option number four, are we leaving the district shortchanged in any way? I understand the short-term borrowing piece, but in any other way, are we leaving, could we be leaving the district shortchanged given the fact we don't know where the budgets are gonna fall? So, so we're looking at it through the lens again of creating sustainable revenue limit capacity. So I'm, I'm looking through it in the lens of not trying to provide a one or two year solution, but permanent mm -hmm. because after those six years are up, that $480,000 would permanently be there within the revenue limit. Um, you're correct in that if, if the revenue loss was more significant at the state level and you wanted to use like $2 million in one year of, of educational programming to sustain that budget, that you would have less flexibility if you were paying six years worth of debt payments up front because you haven't created um, a larger revenue limit capacity in one year or ability to pay for additional expenses. Mm -hmm. um, so I started with the conversation about the OPEB liability mm -hmm. and certainly our focus right now in this year to shore that up so that that isn't a concern um, because there is an unfunded liability portion. So I think that's one focus point. Uh, and the other piece is just maintaining our facilities. And so we continue to, to do that through the construction and through the general maintenance budget for the, the district. So you think about fund balance being available as well for unexpected emergency repairs on a capital level to take care of our facilities. And we would continue to have resources to do that. So we've considered some of those major areas, but yes, if you commit 2.4 million, it limits other movements you could do for fund balance in the future. And that was to Kim's point earlier that we could choose to prepay the, the 900,000 in, in option three, um, I'll say in a more immediate time frame, And then uh, we could wait until perhaps after a budget repair bill uh, in the, the fall to decide how much further if we would want to um, prepay the WRS debt. Correct, because we don't know um, what um, kind of requests there will be from the legislature in terms of spending down fund balance in order to access aids or whatever, because there's certainly um, conversation legislatively about um, the amount of fund balance that school districts have. Mm -hmm. well, um, is that a scenario that you could pull together, Jonathan, to kind of showcase, you know, if so, for example, if we did fund three or uh, option three here as an example in the near term, and then um, let's say in October, we find out that there's funds available that we can then move forward. What does that mean versus having to just borrow whatever that short term was? It was $24,000. You know, what? It, uh, how does that actually impact us versus the the potential upside of, of moving forward a little bit more aggressively now. Um, and, I, and to your point, Noel, I, I, I agree with you on the, you know, have we thought about the ninth domino, if you will, you know, on what would happen if we only had, you know, 15% in our fund balance and something, you know, this happened or that happened or something else. Obviously we do have short-term borrowing. We have other things we could be doing, but um, is there anything that, could sneak up on us that, you know, and, and how do we try to think through those options as much as humanly possible before making a commitment? Joe, just as a historical perspective, uh, did, I, I'm sure, or Kim, I'm sure we've done short-term borrowing before for things. Um, am I correct? I would, in my small mind that's left for the day, um, looking at 
thinking about Aaron during when Aaron Green was here, I think there were times we did short term borrowing. Is that would that be correct? Yes, no, maybe. I, you know, since my tenure on the board, I don't recall that we did short term borrowing. That's not to say that that didn't happen before uh, that time frame. Okay. Um, I, I mean, I, and Jonathan, I think showed. You know, what is the cost associated with that? Um, so it, I don't believe that we've short-term borrowed since the early 2000s. Okay, thank you, Kim. And, and one other thing, I'm not sure how this is gonna impact or not, but I know that some of the rules and regulations and we, um, as outlined in one of our future agenda items are still kind of thinking through plans for the fall. Um, and so one of my concerns is if we eliminate any funds in the budget to support capital improvements. And then we realize that we need some capital improvements to actually educate students. Um, you know, I just, you know, and, I, and it's, it's timing is everything, right? So I mean, <laughs> we are where we are. We know what we know at this point in time, but um, you know, are there any concerns or questions that we maybe have in those immediate meetings to be thinking about from plans in the fall and making sure that we can actually, if, if at all, you know, if and when possible, um, get students would back that, in the schools. Kim, would that be part of your, uh, re you're referring to it as what, the return to schools or return to? Yeah, so we're beginning to uh, engage a group of people to look at the reopening Greendale schools plans. Um, and so we'll be thinking about safety, procedures, learning, relationships, and social emotional needs of our students upon return. Um, so that will be all pieces that we'll be looking at in terms of what the costs may be associated with that. They are really unknown at this time. Yeah. But, but there seems to be more of a, a, a near-term need conversation. So we talked about you know notifying uh, you know, if we want to prepay any amount here, um, we would need to take action um, prior to June 1st, and then we could pay it still in this current fiscal year, which would then have an impact on our ability to, uh, I'll, I'll say, free up spending from having it tied to this WRS debt to educational pieces. So... Correct, and, and I would recommend using next week, Tuesday, where we were originally planned to have a joint meeting um, as a special meeting, if in fact you wanted to take action to do some sort of prepayment. Okay, so let's let's finish the conversation on that. It sounds as if there's interest, I, I think, uh, of moving forward. Uh, what I'm sensing from the, the conversation is that people are comfortable with maybe that option three at this point but holding off till um, you know a budget repair bill or you know a fall, you know holding off until more information is known to go beyond that. Um, but I want to open it up to the full board to just let me to say whether or not that's kind of where people are at um, right now. Option three makes sense to me um, for the reasons mentioned, um, and just the unknowns coming forward. I I. I think that we need to maybe look at this one. And I would, you know, going back to my statement before, I would, I'd be interested, it would be interesting to know, and if it's something that you can pull together, Jonathan, for that conversation, you know, what is, what are the actual dollars difference that would be available um, if we did the 900 now and then the rest of it after the next you know, what does that look like if you look at the next two or three school years um, versus just next school year? Because obviously we, we want to free up and we know that that revenue limit will be available. But if it's a major difference, and then you talked about the 11% opening that would come from uh, state aid, I'm, only a portion of that would obviously be available this year and some next year. And I don't know how that, you know, changes all the, the actual numbers when you start laying that out. Um, does that make sense? So looking at kind of three with a, a side of four, if you will, in, in the next year versus three and four, because uh, we know what those are based upon what you just presented to us. And then looking at it from what does that mean for not just 2020, 2021, but if you look at the next two or three years, 
or if you wanted to look at the entire, it's a six year term, right, that we currently have left. So maybe we just look at what does that mean just related to this over the next six years? Yes, absolutely. We can pull that together. And, and is that something that we would want for that special meeting that we will be looking to have next week? Or is that something that we would want after that? Um, kind of getting your thoughts I, or? I think we'd want it. I mean, I think to make the decision, we'd want that just because if we real, I mean, I don't know what it would be off the top of my head and where those numbers would come in. But knowing that it's, we're talking in $24,000 versus our current 71,000 of real interest in dollars. Um, I don't wanna throw that one out from consideration until we understand what the actual dollar impact is on, on kind of the hybrid scenario, because if it you know, end up, you know, potentially by an inaction, you know, losing out on, you know, $50,000 next year and some more, you know, more than that, because uh, our revenue limit would be. Uh, so I, I would just be interested to know what that means and, and look at it from kind of real dollars versus revenue limit. Um, um, of what's what you know what's available and accessible to make that decision with all the information that we at least have. So, Jonathan, is that something that could be done by by a meeting next week? We have already done the last two weeks. We've been kind of playing Great. with the analysis on this. So I will have all that for you before the meeting um, to review ahead of time. All right, great. So I, I think what, what I'm hearing from the board is let's move forward with scheduling a, a special board meeting next week. Um, and, and Kim, you said, let's do it on the Tuesday, which was already pre-planned for the, the um, meeting with the village board. Let's do it at that time. And then at that meeting, we will then come up, we'll take action on exactly which option we want to move forward with. Yes. And just so you know, we lost Noelle, so she has not sounded in. She's going to attempt to log back in. She's her computer locked up, so she'll rejoin us when she can. Okay. Um, Is there, um, can, can you walk through Jonathan one last thing real quick? So there, there's the, numbers in the actual document 5.1 agenda item 5.1 and it talks about total revenue uh, and total expenses um, increase of approximately five hundred and nine thousand two hundred and two dollars and twenty cents so 1.59 percent uh, in total for fund 10 it, you know from an ex expectation perspective and then the presentation we just went through if you would have gone back a couple slides, the numbers that you presented there, I just want to make sure I'm 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 looking at the right numbers because it mentions the increase, but I would I don't know what the total number is. So, so we're expecting a total budget was like thirty. Here we go, thirty-two five. This is this is what we're talking about right here. This is what we're talking about. And so okay. with these assumptions, there's still increase in the number of students under the revenue limit. So that wouldn't be impacted by cha the changes to state law that we've mentioned here. Got it. That given that we have more students, there still would be some additional revenue, but it would not be at the level that we had built that uh, March budget off of. Got it. I just wanted to make sure I was looking at the understanding that that's the 509202 increase is included in this 32 million 550 you know 1339 dollars um okay and that and for all intents and purposes looking down here that's essentially assuming we are nothing you know we are there's zero increases the only reason it's higher is because of the students essentially essentially yes yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. I, okay. I just wanted to make sure that when you know if people are looking around, you're like, you know, you're talking about decreases, but there's more money. Well, it's yep. uh, we're, we're 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 talking. There's the only reason that's happening is that it's you, you, there's money that comes per student, um, and our membership's growing. So, okay. Right. Yes, so, and we and what we're sh what we showed you on the next slide here is just all of the ways that we are holding back with potential savings if we fall far short of what is being presented in that budget, so. 
Okay. Have a total range of reductions um, that under consideration that we won't commit to, um, ranging from six hundred to fifth to six hundred thousand to one point five million. Got it. And, and those really match scenarios two and three. So if I can jump back further, because we have all these scenarios, it's very close, very close to scenario two and three here um, that we've we've had um, School Administrators Alliance give us that modeling scenario as a potential. And then in scenario three, we've had the governor float the number two billion. That has not been verified by the Legislative Fiscal Bureau, but because that's come up as a discussion point for the state advocating for additional revenues, we believe that it's appropriate that we should be understanding what the budget looks like in that in that scenario. Yeah. And so those numbers, the 900 and some thousand potential and savings would bring us from this, you know, from two to three, essentially. Correct. Okay. Because the 32.5 is essentially scenario two. No, or the 32.5 is scenario one. And then um, what would take us to scenario two is the frozen pay that we frozen yeah. pay. And got then- it, got it. Um, Okay. The, the additional 913 would bring us to scenario three. Okay. So the this preliminary budget is being would be brought back then at a meeting in June, right, Jonathan? And then we would then vote on that um, based on preliminary. You know, this would be preliminary because our fiscal year starts July 1st. Yes. Yes, yeah, so the listing of potential savings items we're going to continue to revise. That's for discussion at this point. And so we have a team of about 15 to 20 staff members that are having conversations on a weekly basis, looking at what all the options may be and going to do some surveying with all staff. And we'll revise and prioritize what those savings opportunities would look like in the the 2021 school year. Okay, and then what conversations, um, how, how has this been vetted with the, the Citizen uh, Finance Committee? So we've um, discussed that there are this range of options uh, of what the state budget may be. And that was part of the discussion that we had with our community finance 101. And then did you share with the, the finance uh, citizen finance team, um, the, the prepayment of the, the uh, WRS debt? So we shared that with our district budget team because we have weekly ongoing meetings. I wanted to have some conversation at the board level to understand if that's an area that we want to have um, further discussion. And so we would reach out, I'll reach out to that budget team and pull them together prior to next Tuesday. Um, okay. to have some further conversation. All right, great, great. All right, A any other questions? So, so it sounds that we'll, we'll move forward with having a special meeting at um, next week, Tuesday, and then we'll also, uh, Jonathan will continue to work with uh, the, the business team uh, to bring forward a, a preliminary budget that we will approve um, in June as we go to our fiscal new year. Um, what, what about where do the student fees fall in then, Jonathan? You know, we, we talked a little bit about uh, lunch fees and things, um, but you know, when we reviewed the student fees, there's conversation about, you know, is there something that we could do to uh, reduce fees for the, the 2021 school year? Yeah, so I do not have that listed here as an additional expenditure option. Um, when we provide that final uh, preliminary budget in June, uh, we, we've we looked at the costing of that at about a 20 or 25% discount. And so I think understanding some potential restructuring of Fund 38 to create capacity may help to understand how some of those revenues could be offset for for next year um, on that uh, basis to try and um, a, as a goal target some fee fee reductions okay. for families okay thank you 
All right. Any other discussion? Otherwise, I think it was a great conversation. Yeah, uh, um, agreed. And one um, one other thought or conversation too, and I'm not sure where you know you've been thinking about this across the district team, Kim. But it'd be also interesting to you know, are there other we're talking about how we can cut, but is there other other ways that we can also add revenue? Um, and so those I think are also going to be helpful for us to think a little bit differently around maybe how we can bridge some of these gaps, especially in the in the near term, but ultimately in ways that might help us be a better district in the long term. So um, look forward to that and just want to say once again, you know, I know you're dealing with and kind of trying to navigate a lot of uncertainty. So thank you for uh, trying to make sense of all the ambiguity that is in front of us when it comes to what state and federal uh, agencies are doing or not doing or might be doing and could be doing. Um, yeah, this is uh, not an easy thing to navigate school finance to begin with, much less when you add in uh, all the additional things we're dealing with. So thanks. Absolutely. I think, I, I think tonight's conversation um, coupled with the the budget 101 that you presented um, earlier this month, um, I think those are great examples of how the district um, operates transparently and prudently. So um, I, I think this is just a great example of how we had a conversation with the teachers, with the community, with the board, um, and we continue to operate transparently and prudently. So thank you, Jonathan. As we move on to the next agenda item, in the interest of time, I would suggest reordering the agenda to put the third trimester reports before the policy and to table the social emotional wellness report until June 1st. Okay, that seems to make sense. Um, has Noel and Noel's rejoined us. All right, so is there a motion to reorder the agenda? I move that we reorder the agenda to move the tri, uh, third trimester reports up and to um, put social emotional wellness onto our June meeting. Is there a second? Second. All right, um, call for roll call vote, Kim? Yes. Noel? Yes. Kathy? Yes. Thor? Yes. And I am yes. All right, so we will then uh, jump ahead um, to the third trimester reports. We've got... Uh, we, we heard our last board meeting from some of the central office departments. So today we are here to, we will be hearing from the um, principals, the building principals, as well as athletics and park and recreation. As you can imagine the, with the shift in the, the in March, um, it has impacted how the third uh, short cycle goals have been adjusted and modified. And so I leave it to uh, uh, the principals and um, to walk you through their goals. Okay, good evening. Um, we'll start with the we'll start with the high school here and uh, Associate Principal Chris Del Ponte and I will be presenting the third short cycle information uh, regarding one of the three JHS goal areas, the strategic priority of career pathways. So for our short time this evening, We'll specifically be discussing the current status of the planning for the Connect Media Communications Program, our new Pathway Academy launching in the fall of 2020. So one of the third cycle goals was to finalize the roster for Connect. Uh, through an application process, we considered over 50 different applications from our soon-to-be juniors and seniors. And we examined not only academic data, but we also heavily considered the applicants' post-secondary goals and other information that they provided in a personal statement. As of today, we have worked hard at making the schedules work for this two hour class and are at our capacity of 36 students in this first year program. Another one of the third cycle goals was to increase the communication about the program to the students and their families. And although we've obviously been able to communicate via letters and emails that are being sent home, we have not had any sort of ability to hold any meetings or orientations with the 36 students and their families since the schools closed in March. Um, so we have to be committed to continue providing summer updates to our students and families 
around the Connect program. And as soon as we safely can, we'll plan something on site and more personal as far as a program orientation with our students and their families to hear more about the, the program, meet the teachers and to see the learning space. Uh, Mr. Del Ponte will now talk about the final three goals. Hi everyone, thanks for having us this evening. Um, and then the final three goals, uh, we really wanna focus on what we call onboarding students into the program and to connect as it's a, it's a unique, it'll have a, a unique culture to it, something that many students will have never really encountered before. Um, we had hoped to start some of this in the spring, but you know, as Mr. Lotus said, with um, with the pandemic and with the school closures, uh, we weren't able to start as much as we wanted to. But through our summer communication and through potentially some uh, introduction lessons and experiences and orientations, we hope to really get students and families acclimated to the, the unique experiences that they will have with and connect. Uh, the fourth goal that we hope to accomplish and we're starting to work on is to develop partnerships to provide mentors to students. Um, and actually, Jonathan, could you go to the next slide? Um, and if you actually, Jonathan, on the fourth row could click on mentor survey, the link. So a cornerstone component of this program is um, the ability for students to have a mentor in their project areas and in their pathways. And Tom Herman, our consortium director has been um, at work. He's kind of our partner go-to and he has started uh, crafting a survey and we actually finalized the survey that's gonna go out to um, local businesses and professionals about becoming a Connect mentor. And I believe Steve, um, you had said we already have in a short time about nine to 10 people have already responded, correct? Correct. Yeah, so um, we, the model for this was based off of what they've done at Pewaukee High School with a similar program. And the goal with this form is to just garner interest. And then once we have interest, and uh, if you can scroll down a little bit more, Jonathan, um, in this form that's being sent out, there's the first name, last name, what is your job title? And then further down, it's just basically what are some expertise areas um, that you have? And so when we, after we do this, Tom will follow up and we'll have a much more lengthy conversation about potential interest in being a mentor, guest speaker, uh, some type of contributor to the program. Um, then you can head back to the other slide, Jonathan. Thanks. And then the fifth and final goal that we're working on is to conduct initial sessions to plan learning experiences, themes, and projects and requirements. So we're starting to kind of shift our focus from getting students and planning some of those initial startup, um, initial um, initial logistics to focusing a lot more on the learning that's going on and what that first, the first couple months is gonna look like within Connect. Uh, where our goal is to schedule summer planning sessions and be really intentional on what we uh, what we're going to do a, a kind of as a teaching team within connect as well uh, they're going to work on the teachers will work on some projects some some projects some project outlines and really look at authentic experiences to bring uh, within the pathway uh, and so we hope to start these meetings during the summer and then um, continue that that process that de design process throughout the summer and into the school year um, thanks, and if you have any questions, uh, Mr. Lotus and I would be happy to answer them now. All right, thanks, Chris. Uh, any questions? Uh, just a quick question. If there's a need to go online again next year at any point, how easy uh, is it for the Connect program to do that? That's interesting that you mentioned that. We actually, we had a meeting a couple of weeks ago and we kind of floated that idea about out there about having a flexible first experience. So knowing that there is some unknowns to this, uh, just be wary that, you know, as, as a team um, to have some options available. So no matter if we're meeting, whatever the mode is that we're meeting, uh, just to make sure that we can offer a really, a really unique experience and enrich, enriching experience for students. Thank you. What, um, out of curiosity, what do you what do you expect to be kind of the average commitment for a mentor? This question was asked when we took the survey to the chamber. So Tom Herman joined the Chamber of Commerce networking event last week Thursday, and the answer is one to two hours per month. Okay, that's really that's nice. Good now, it might be worth even adding that into um, the survey. If it's not, I don't I don't know if I saw it when I looked through it. 
Um, there was some initial uh, information on being a mentor in the at the top part of the survey, um, and so it, it'll be a mix and a flexible mix. Uh, we want to get the best possible mentors, and sometimes it'll be a um, it could be an email, um, it could be a Zoom of some sort, uh, but we certainly want to have some uh, some celebrations along the way too, where we bring the mentors into the building. All right, thank you. Um, and it's a great program just to, you know, again, uh, connect our, our students with real life work experience. So it's a great opportunities. And very much aligns with our goals around career pathways to viable careers. All right, is John and Emily gonna do the middle school then? Yeah, John, yeah, John. Do the next page. All right, so our uh, focus or one of our goals is in to increase satisfaction score on the student engagement sure. survey. Um, and these are the questions that we kind of focus on. Um, as you can see, our numbers either went down from 2018 or um, kind of were the same. There wasn't that much change. Um, so we really wanted to focus on these questions and um, work on the school climate and how students treat each other. Um, so our short cycle goals, um, for this cycle um, was to provide our student um, and climate and culture group the tools and strategies to speak up against biased language at school. And then also um, our source of strength uh, group was going to create the We Belong campaign. Um, Jonathan, you can move on. Okay. Um, so within this action step um, for our student group and focus group, we um, put together a group of students to um, go through some of our data and to look at um, how we are doing with our climate and culture at the middle school. And so um, this group also met with our student uh, board represent, uh, representatives, Emma Bodie and Megan Jacobs. So they came over and kind of and spoke with them about academic awareness and um, co-curricular awareness and belonging in the school. And one thing that came up at our last meeting was just um, finding their voice. And so we reached out to Amy Mellick and she uh, shared with us the presentation. Um, and so this is, we were going to go through this with our students or with this group, um, just to give them the tools that they need to be able to speak up towards that bias language, um, towards things that they're hearing in the hallway that they don't like. Um, and things like that. So th it, the presentation is linked. We don't necessarily need to um, go through that. And we didn't obviously get to that this school year, um, but this will be something that we will definitely be doing in fall with our students. Um, uh, as well as the source of strength, um, if you can just go back real quick. <laughs> um, so it, it changed a little bit for our source of strength as we were gonna do the We Belong campaign, um, but obviously that was more in-person um, stuff. And so, they kind of switched gears and they did more of a digital learning um, for Source of Strength and provided different activities that John will be talking about in the next slide. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you to the board members for allowing us to present tonight. I just wanna, I just wanna thank Emily um, for her work this year too. She did a great job of pulling together a group of students to really analyze and take a look at um, our student engagement survey results and uh, ran them through uh, quite a few activities all prior to us forming the Sources of Strength group. Um, and it was just great to, uh, to get their voice in some of the work that we were doing, uh, doing this year. Um, specific to Sources of Strength, this, we implemented this in, uh, in late fall and um, ran a, a couple of campaigns. And during this time of digital learning, there was a focus on really um, helping our students with their social emotional wellness. And a couple of activities were conducted during this time of digital learning. And um, there's three of them that are two of them that I have listed there. And one of them was the, um, the, the sources of strength campaign called hashtag what helps us. And so students were able to submit pictures, short videos of just what helps them during this time. Um, there might be examples of positive friends, their own pets, uh, giving back, so generosity, healthy activities that they um, were engaged in, um, being able to reach out to trusted adults. Uh, and then another activity was, um, again, kind of an engaging activity was something called Quingo, um, which allowed students to pick different activities and post uh, pictures of themselves participating. Um, so just an opportunity for them to have some choices and be engaged during this time of digital learning. And then the last thing is 
um, the group did uh, is looking to get some feedback from our students. So uh, today, actually it was today, um, a survey was sent out to the Sources of Strength members um, just to get a, ref uh, a reflection from our first year of implementation. So uh, questions included, what, what did they like about the, the program? Um, how would they describe uh, sources of strength? And then why is it an uh, important program for Greendale Middle School? So just using that feedback as we move into, into year two. Next slide, Jonathan. And then we just wanted to share, um, I'm, we're not going to read through all of these, but we asked two questions. Um, what's been the impact of sources of strength on our school climate? So that goes back to our specific the goal and just some of the highlights include um, we had our our advisors excuse me we had our advisors uh, just share some thoughts on on the impact um, and just some of the highlights included uh, having an opportunity for diverse groups of students to participate in a leadership role serve as role models in in our in our school give our students um, a voice while really focusing on the positive as aspects of what we can do as a school um, to improve our school climate the opportunity to really make connections with the students, not only with the adults, but peer to peer. And then finally, uh, just being able to engage in some very meaningful conversation. Next slide, Jonathan. Um, and then they also talked to just about um, how did things go with their first campaign, campaign just getting the word out, um, kind of what's next. And as you can see, again, not reading through all these, but um, the support and positivity we, we will be able to spread to our DMS community. So they're excited about that for the return. Um, it allowed our student advisors to be creative, work together as a team and become leaders in their school. Um, worked together to create a great kickoff event that had the whole school participating. The kids take uh, ownership, came up with ideas and started creating an all school activity. Their peers really listened to them and asked, asked appropriate questions. And then just introducing a positive culture shift to the whole student body. And so um, just meeting with with the advisors, um, I know that they're really excited to get back in fall to meet with the whole group and and do some more campaigns, um, especially within this time or during this time. Um, they really are hopeful that Source of Strength will help uh, just the student body with the climate, but um, and just help with uh, the positive culture. So at that time or at this time, do you guys have any questions for us? Thank you, Emily and Jen. All right, Canterbury, I am um, presenting on the reading goal this evening. And our goal for the district at the beginning of the year was looking at our students that are proficient on the star score, that they're 50th percentile or above. And those students would increase by 11 percentage points from fall to spring. And the growth in percentage points of students of color, students with disabilities and students receiving free and reduced lunch will be at least the same as the total population from fall to spring. And Canterbury's specific building goal was that 70% of students that take star reading assessment will reach the expected achievement levels. And that's that scale score of 50% or higher. I included our winter star scores here so you could see those. Unfortunately, due to our um, safer at home order, we were not able to complete the spring testing, but um, I included the winter scores and then the change from fall to winter. You can see that all of our demographic groups increased their scores and we had an overall increase at Canterbury of 11% and we actually met our, um, our goal of at least 70% of our students um, meeting that 50th percentile or higher. And we had um, really good gains in a lot of our, um, across our demographic groups. In our th third trimester, our proposed goal was that we were going to focus on um, having teachers meet with students in purposeful groups. They were going to focus on a strategy or skill based upon students pre and post assessments, um, looking at our units of study and students that scored below the 50th percentile on STAR during that winter test. So we were correlating those two pieces of information. Unfortunately, we were not able to do that. Actually, during trimester three, um, students participated in digital learning. Our students that have tier three reading needs met with or are meeting with our reading specialists and our students with disabilities are meeting with their case managers as well to make sure that we're moving that reading um, forward during this time. I also included um, across our grade levels, K-5, I included 
Um, this is in the board report as well, but our learning platforms that our students are using digitally to engage in reading. Uh, the percentage of students that are engaged at least 75% of the time. So it's kind of um, you know, different at each grade level. And then some parent feedback was included in there as well. Um, really liking the Zoom meetings, the read alouds that the teachers are putting out every week. Um, being able to have those connections with students was really important as well. Um, as we move into the next school year, I think you've heard tonight as well, and just kind of watching the news that how how important our relationships are with each other. So I think that's gonna be something that is so important as we move into whatever next year is gonna look like and kind of getting our feet under us with this digital format and really figuring out what works well for our students and our families. Did you, um, could I ask a question about the, um, the second grade? I noticed they were at a 58% engagement. Um, was there mm -hmm. any, any feedback that you had why they were a little lower than the other grade levels? There is a lot of different needs at that grade level. And we have a lot of families that have um, both parents are working or they're essential workers or there's other things going on in the home or people have gotten sick. And so there's a lot, a lot of, of, of differing needs at that grade level. And so the teachers have reached out, I've reached out, our pupil services have reached out. So it's just, there's a lot going on there more so than just trying to engage with the digital learning. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And College Park is going to report on our math goals for this trimester. So we continued um, at the end of the year, we wanted to meet our annual goal, which was that 50% of those students who began below the 50th percentile would grow at least one proficiency level. And while we weren't able to give the end of the year test, our mid-year test showed that 35% of our students had made, made that growth already. Um, and when we broke that down into subgroups, um, we were looking specifically at students with disabilities and English learners, um, along with students who identify as a race other than white. Um, when, uh, with the growth goal, um, the students with disabilities and English learners did not meet the mid-year goal, but when we look at overall proficiency, there was great growth in there as shown in the, the chart that's up now. So all of our groups made some progress, some more than others. Um, our English learners, many of them came in and had been in the country less than a year. So um, going up by 20 points, the number of students who were proficient on that test was a really impressive goal. We are very proud of our students with disabilities and their growth. But again, the students who identify as a race other than white, while their overall growth wasn't as great, um, those students who started below the 50th percentile made a greater, greater jump. So when we looked at what to do on the next slide, our strategies really were going back to talking about math, which is something we've been doing for a few years, but we looked for specific research on helping students who are English learners and students with disabilities. And there was a video and an article on those four R's, and it's really just engaging kids in the talk. How do you talk about math? How do you do those checks that somebody understands that they heard? Can they rephrase it? You know, can they say it a new, new way? Can they record their thinking? And then we used math talking prompt cards. Our fourth grade team had started this and we, um, we had PD on it a, a week before we went home, uh, but we were able to incorporate that into some of our learning. And those prompt cards are really those respectful conversations that we use in our readers and writers workshop saying, I agree with you because, or I, I, I disagree. These are the reasons why I disagree. Or could you tell me more about that? Cause that's kind of unclear. So we got that professional development in. Um, and then on the next slide, how we used that when we continued from home was our teams worked really closely together to make sure that every child had someone to check in for math reading and writing every week. Some students had more than one one-on-one um, -on -one conference. Some um, just had the one for each subject area. But between all of our teachers working together, all of our kids were getting multiple opportunities to talk about math. Um, we would pull small groups. We'd do some Zoom lessons and then they could talk about what their learning was. We tried some new formats. We've had IXL and Dreambox and those were working well to supplement our instruction, but our fourth and fifth grade especially looked at Khan Academy and started um, groups on that to give more direct instruction to kids and have them check their progress. And then they would meet with the groups to talk about math and to talk through their learning and um, how they were progressing as well as checking their progress on Khan Academy. 
but we also continued our collaboration. So we would meet every other week with our math specialist, um, along with the special ed teachers, the English learner, learning support teacher, and the classroom teachers to go through what those standards are, who we, how we knew kids were learning, how we were differentiating, and then tried to come up with some ways to increase engagement. Um, some grade levels would just have optional math meetings. Sometimes they had Prodigy, fr Prodigy Fridays where kids could um, sign up on Prodigy and show their progression there. Um, fourth grade started the steam challenges where kids were either building a tower or they made a marble run and then they would share those through Flipgrid. But we really tried to reach out and come up with some new strategies and ideas. And while it was a really rough couple of months when we started, so a lot of our teachers said they've learned so much about how to truly differentiate. So when we go to the next steps um, for when we come back next fall, um, just continuing to think about how we can differentiate, whether we're in the building or not in the building, how are we gonna use what we've learned with technology and really capitalize on that? Because it's been a huge growth for us. Um, and we found a lot of really good things that happened. We found a lot of students who didn't necessarily um, always engage 100% in school are doing really well and trying to figure, figure that out. Why are some kids doing so well? Why are some kids struggling? But what, at the start of the year, um, just being able to build those strong relationships with students and families. And, and that's gonna be the tricky part. Um, using Google Classroom at all levels, that's been our most successful tool for getting information out. And I think it's nice if everyone's using the same tool. So when you have kids at different grade levels, you, they're all using the same platform. Um, and then we'll continue that mathematical thinking. So while we started it online, what's that gonna look like if we are in the classroom or how are we gonna continue to talk about math? and just keeping our kids and their families engaged through multiple sources. And one of the things we found this year is it isn't just the students who needed support, our parents, our families really needed a way to connect. So we came up with some strategies for that. Um, and also I have to say a shout out, shout out to our PTO that really um, let all of us know how valued we were as well and um, went above and beyond with Teacher Appreciation Week. But it really, it's been a matter of supporting everybody and uh, I'm proud of our work that we did with that in the academics, but also that social emotional piece. Any questions from the board? All right, thank you, Carrie, and thank you for that. Okay, hi everyone. I am going to share our culture and climate goal for short cycle three for Highland View. Um, our annual goal had been um, to work around student perceptions of kindness, safety, engagement, and empowerment on the playground to make those perceptions more positive and increase as measured by our school-created student recess survey. Um, in addition, we were looking at decreasing the number of major and minor behavioral referrals that we had on the playground. So for our short cycle goal for the third trimester, we were looking to continue to work with our fourth grade ambassadors around the planning and preparation process as they present to and engage their peers in kindergarten through fifth grade around safety, kindness, fairness, and problem solving at recess. So at the conclusion of our second short cycle, we had our team of fourth grade ambassadors meet with each grade level around respecting each other's gameplay and game boundaries, as well as sharing playground materials appropriately. Another group of fourth grade ambassadors performed a skit for each grade level, showing problems that had been happening at recess and how to better ha um, handle those situations. They left each grade level with a goal to be safe and respect everyone's play outside. Uh, audience participation during the skits that the ambassadors presented demonstrated an understanding of their learning objective. However, due to our stay at home order, we did not have the opportunity to continue working toward our annual goal. One thing that we looked at um, that we think really made a difference and made improvements between our first and short, um, short second, first and second short cycles was the emphasis that we placed on student voice and leadership and how that was critical for students in achieving ownership um, of the problems that can arise during recess and buy in around ways to solve them. The plan was then to continue that work with them during our third short cycle, and students had already started to engage in that work to create additional lessons, videos, skits, and become peer models around recess safety, respect, and student engagement and empowerment focused on inclusion, problem solving, and fairness. 
So as we made this, the switch to our virtual learning environment and realized we would be working online indefinitely, we knew it was important to continue to build and further strengthen our classroom and school communities. Teachers specifically focused on ways to do this through creating videos and read alouds, uh, classroom slideshows, organizing classroom Facebook page, pages or using the Blooms or Seesaw app. Um, they had classroom meetings uh, or, for, um, via Zoom. They did shout outs to different students, um, displaying PBIS character traits. And then our third through fifth grades used GoGuardian chat as well. Um, in addition, students who were having difficulty engaging were further supported through email and phone by their teachers and other specialists and encouraged to join those class meetings, chat with their teachers and participate in the assigned learning. Our PBIS team also worked to increase our school-wide community through um, our Facebook membership. Our, our actual Facebook membership has doubled since March, um, which has been great to see. Um, we had uh, continued our March and April and, uh, not March, April and May PTO meetings through Zoom. We've had multiple spirit days like Favorite Team Friday. We did Autism Awareness Day. We had a crazy hair day where staff did crazy hair and the kids had to guess which staff member the crazy hair belonged to. That was on April Fools that we did that. Um, we did career day when we missed our career day that we typically have at school, um, superhero day. Um, today was Olympic day where the kids wore red, white, and blue. We had Olympic week bingo to um, celebrate that Olympic day. And then we have, um, a summer send off that's happening on Friday with different, almost like a, a virtual yearbook that the kids are doing. They're taking pictures and sending those in to me and I'm gonna create a big um, collage of that moving forward. So overall, the student engagement throughout our digital learning period has remained high. So these are um, the percentages of students engaged at 75% or greater across our building. Um, it's important to note though that this is subjective data. There's not a real true way to measure this. This is based on the teacher's um, perception of engagement. 4K does not have data because they, they specifically engaged through their Facebook posts, which is very hard to measure. So then with our digital learning period extending through our third trimester this year, our main challenge for next year will be around how we will address the achievement gap both academically and in the case of culture and climate, socially and emotionally for our students. We will need to figure out what barriers, both academic and social emotional, there are to student success and then devise strategies to address those barriers. It will be important for us to analyze and reflect upon our universal instruction at that tier one level to ensure that there are multiple on-ramps for students and multiple points of instruction around new routines and procedures within our building. So specifically, we'll work to create routines and procedures for our new spaces. We have lots of them for next year, which is super exciting. Um, we'll continue to understand our students and their behaviors by looking through a culturally responsive and equitable lens. We'll increase our staff capacity and knowledge around effective co-planning and collaboration strategies and provide professional development through our tier one PBIS team around the importance of building relationships and the difference between restorative and punitive consequences. So on behalf of Sarah and Carrie and myself, we'd like to thank you for your time and answer any questions you might have for us or for me, because they already asked questions. <laughs> thank you, Tracy. What questions or comments uh, for any of the elementary school principals? Well, I'd like to make a comment to just all of the uh, principals. Um, just uh, hats off to you for the hard work that you and your staffs continue to do during this time. Um, I've said it before that I've heard um, from families in the community that um, they feel that the schools have been doing uh, a, a good service during this time, despite the, the circumstances we're in. So I just want to compliment all of you on the hard work and um, your staffs as well. Just let them know that we appreciate the work that they're doing. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you, Tracy. So I'm gonna fill in for Ms. Schweitzer this evening and go through the park and recreation update quickly. 
Um, our annual goal was the launch of an online, online community portal for submitting facility use requests. And so our short cycle is monitoring that implementation that we had just begun at the last short cycle. So again, as of March 2nd, these were the items that we had accomplished. And um, in that early March period, we were ready to go. And now obviously things have changed a little bit in terms of the ability for the community to access and reserve our facilities. Um, we have continued to monitor that, that program because our community members do have the ability to go forward and create their user accounts. So there's been four user accounts that we've um, supported. That's in addition to a number of accounts that were already created prior to that launch. There was some demo work that was done on a trial basis. Um, we've also got a survey posted. So as we've got new community members that come online to that, if they have feedback right away when they're utilizing that tool, um, they can provide that survey information to us so that we can refine um, and update that use. Our next steps, uh, we're gonna have facilities available as we can uh, allow based on um, uh, health orders and state um, orders. Uh, we'll continue to follow those and um, respond appropriately. We're going to add our new construction spaces into the community use. So we are waiting till the end of our school year and now doing the planning on what those room spaces and numbers will be. We can build that in. So we'll have that ready to go in the fall. Um, we're going to continue to assist the public with that use and gather feedback. And then there is a newer tool that's going to come online in the next six months uh, for school dude which is the software platform and so we are going to continue to work with that development team as that gets to a place where it can uh, transition from our current um, program that we have now recently implemented um, that long term will have a better visual and navigation interface um, so we're going to continue to work with our community to get online but knowing that there will be the newer and better system um, down the road uh, in the future that we can launch off of um, with this platform so with our new facilities and our referendum upgrades we're hopeful that sooner rather than later, uh, we'll have opportunities for our community to come in and, and use those spaces. Any questions on that? All right, thanks, Jonathan, and share things with, with Jackie. Thank you. Is that all the updates? Or was, yeah. Um, all right, uh, thank you. Um, I, I think these trimester reports, uh, again, are a good example of being transparent with the community is where, you know, the, the principals, the, the um, central office staff are all sharing updates with where we are at with making progress. So thank you. Um, now, um, moving to agenda item 5.2, the review of policy. So our uh, policy committee has met and they're bringing forward two policies tonight. Uh, re one regarding uh, maintenance of confidential student records and the second one is uh, elementary and secondary search and seizure. Yes, so the first one is uh, student records and this both these policies are coming forward because the WASB policy audit indicated that there were changes that uh, were required to be in compliance with um, current laws around these policies. So um, these both policies were reviewed by legal counsel um, and revisions were suggested. And we also had some conversations about um, how equity is addressed within these policies. Tim, is there anything that you'd want to um, speak to about the student records policy as I know you were working on this? No, I, I think it, just the statement of having legal review and make some recommendations um, for areas that we were a little light in regards to um, where records may be open for request um, were the primary um, spaces where additions were made. So one of the things that was um, mentioned to me as we were, as um, 
since it's been posted over the weekend, is on page three, there's one around law enforcement records being used as the sole basis for taking action on a student under the district's athletic code. Um, and I'm not sure that was what was intended. So we could take that back and just double check that. Um, typically, uh, it actually changes the meaning of what was in the original policy, which was that it couldn't be the sole basis, but it could be used. Um, for a conversation with students. Um, so we can double check what that. Um, Kim, Kim, what, what are, where are you it. referencing? I'm on page three under. Um, I don't know if I have page numbers on here. Are there? No. No, there's no page numbers on here. But if you hover it on the right okay. side, the third. Okay, page, yep, I see. Okay. Um, under A, um, there's one, there's a change there that um, okay. changes does a 180 on the original intent to the policy. So um, we did not discuss that in policy committee, but it is a, a complete reversal. So I can come back and check on that uh, before you take action to approve. Okay. Anything else regarding um, student search? I'm sorry, student records. All right, then we will, the next policy has to do with student search and seizure. Yes, and this is um, governing search and seizure by administration. So this is not a police officer that's doing these searches unless specifically identified as is the case under use of canines and use of breathalyzers. Um, but there, you can see there's been um, some substantial changes here as recommended by legal counsel. Mr. Lotus, are you still online? I don't know if there's anything you wanted to highlight. I am still here, but I'm nothing at this time. I don't have the policy in front of me, so I'd have to be asked a direct question. Okay. And have we cross-referenced this, the revisions to this policy with the policy that we approved just a couple months ago regarding the school resource officer? Yes, it feels like months ago, but it was actually earlier this month. <laughs> so, yeah. yes, we did cross-reference 882 on collaboration with school resource officers and police. And we also cross-referenced 447.1 um, uh, physical force and corporal punishment. And that one was uh, cross-referenced a couple years ago or a couple months ago. Um, that was revised. Um, so I just wanted to clarify, this is policy 446 we're looking at, right? Was it 455.2 before? Because it was on the agenda as 455.2, but I, it appears it's 446. Um, let me check. Looks as if we might be renumbering them. Yes, we're renumbering this one. So it is on is 455.2 um, and that, but it's being renumbered to 446. And again, this is part of the WASB audit and has been reviewed by legal counsel. Yeah, and this has come to the policy committee a few times, I think since September and then a <laughs> um, it's resurfaced numerous times as it's gone through different cycles of review in different groups, including police department, legal, so on and so forth. So there's been a lot of conversation, I think, around this policy over the last few months, um, at least with the policy committee. And I believe, Kim, too, there was discussion at the policies and procedures committee meetings regarding this policy as well, or parts of it. Am I correct in stating yes, that? Yes, very briefly. Yes, there were a couple um, of spots where it intersects with the um, relations with police officers where it was discussed at the policies team meeting. Any further questions on that one? No, it looks like uh, the policy committee has done a thorough review and I'm glad to hear that we've also um, cross reference with our other existing policies as well as with our legal counsel. So thank you. So we will be bringing both these back um, at our first meeting in June for approval. Um, and then uh, you'll give us an update, Kim, regarding the student um, records um, regarding that, that change to the code there. Okay, thank you. And one uh, note on the previous on policy 347, 
on page 10, there's a uh, an issue with just some of the way it's formatted. Um, so as and, and we should probably add page numbers to that one since it's so long or something, just to make it easier to find what we're looking for. <laughs> Yes, I know that Marianne um, does the changes and then when it all jumps around, then she fixes the page numbers um, because there's some things that she does manually. So I, I think she'll clean that up for us um, now that the changes are, um, all the pagation is shifted. She'll clean that up and bring that back on the next review. All right, thank you. Um, all right, then uh, we, we decided that we will um, hear the social emotional wellness report at a later date. Um, Kim, you want to share with us an update on uh, learning and programming uh, during the school closures? Yes, there is a report in here and I just wanted to highlight uh, two places. What you saw in the principal's update was some of the engagement statistics. Um, at the elementary level and where students are at. And by and large, the students who had the most difficulty in the online learning environment are our students um, with disabilities most significantly and some of our students um, who are identified as English learners. And so we saw lower participation rates um, with students who are identified in those areas. And um, that is with teachers reaching out, with teachers making phone calls, um, attempting the real-time video. There are more students engaging because of those efforts, but it's still a group of students who has struggled to engage fully in the learning. And we know that um, we're doing everything that we can to help them access the regular curriculum, um, but they are a group where we're going to need to reconnect um, and continue to look for strategies depending on how we re-engage in the fall. Um, the other piece of this is it's the final week of school. And so as we are closing out the school year, um, a team is beginning work on what it will look like to reopen schools. Um, we are looking at a range of learning um, platforms and learning a continuum of learning activities if we are going, if we are going to remain fully distanced um, all the way up to fully engaged face-to-face -face and blended learning environments in between. Um, so we are looking at what our, op our range of options are and how we can support our students in coming back to that. Um, and the final piece I wanted to highlight is that um, summer school will be completely online. Um, and so we're expecting that to look different, but it will um, be a uh, more calculated pilot of what distance learning could look like as there will be some significant um, opportunity to plan in advance, unlike the um, ready fire aim that was the month of March for our students. So those are the couple of pieces that I wanted to highlight for you. Um, there has been discussion about making sure that legislators know how we have continued to engage students and how our learning has continued. The school connection newsletter went home to families and uh, to all residents in Greendale about a month ago, a little less than a month ago. And the whole centerfold is uh, an explanation of how we move to online learning quickly and how we've continued to engage and serve our students. Um, and that has gone to our legislators as well. All right, great. And, and Kim, you mentioned that summer school is gonna be all online. Um, I think about, you know, our, our summer school participation numbers and, and Jonathan mentioned a little bit in the, about the budget and how our students who participate in summer school are counted toward that overall student member um, population. I think about uh, FIAD is probably one of our more popular classes as far as student participation and that will also be online this, um, this summer. I, I, that's a question. Yes, that's correct. Our high school PE will be online this summer. That is not a place where we're anticipating a drop in participation. Uh, we're anticipating that our participation in summer PE will maintain um, with the online environment. 
um, but we are expecting lower participation rates at the elementary level. Um, while we surveyed parents and there was significant interest in participating in summer school online, it is not nearly to the level of engagement and participation that we um, have come to expect in our regular face-to-face -face summer sure. opportunities. Um, the PE team has been looking at models from other districts who have been in an online distance PE model for several years over the summer months so that we can continue to deliver that instruction and um, ensure students meet the standards of PE. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions? Uh, I think these uh, updates have been uh, uh, a good opportunity just to hear where we are at and how this district is continuing to plan for for options and, and just be prudent with the current situation. So thank you. Um, all right, um, next item, agenda, legislative updates. Anything from the legislature? Uh, yes, I do have a few things. Uh, Kim actually touched on the safer at home, but I just wanted to um, reiterate that um, as of last week, obviously the Wisconsin Supreme Court struck down safer at home, but they left in place the um, the pupil instruction and extracurricular activities to remain in place. Um, and and uh, as Kim and I discussed today, that's really um, in the jurisdiction of the DHS that, that they have the authority to close the schools um, during outbreaks and epidemics and that um, this is set to take place through June 30th, but it's likely that um, they'll be making some additional decisions regarding that. Um, so Kim, I don't know if you have anything to add to that, but you, you've pretty much touched on that tonight. Um, the CARES Act, um, I know that that was mentioned as well tonight. Um, the Budget Committee approved DPI plan for the K-12 CARES Act funds. Um, the Joint Finance Committee has approved DPI's plan for distributing $175 million to the public and private schools through the Federal CARES Act. Um, the, the, the Federal CARES Act requires that 90% of this funding be distributed according to federal formula. Um, that directs funds to school districts based on the proportion of low income students in a school district, uh, such as Title I. Um, the DPI plans to use the remaining 10% of these fund initiatives to train teachers on virtual education and increase the number of courses that are offered virtually. And funding will uh, be also um, able to provide mental health services to students during COVID-19. Um, so that was the CARES Act. Um, the digital divide, I just wanted to um, highlight that during um, COVID-19 that um, it, it was noted in Wisconsin that there is definitely um, a, a disparity between different school districts and um, in communities with the, with the online capabilities. And the data shows that the children are mostly in, um, or they're both in cities and rural areas and they're disproportionately low income and students of color that have been um, impacted by this digital divide. I think in Greendale, it's safe to say that we've, we've made every effort possible to get all of our students up and running. Um, but this, I think it's important statewide to know that this is an issue that's being faced in our schools. Um, and then the last thing, Kim and I discussed this this afternoon, but the um, School Administrative Alliance um, was recommending that school districts share their story um, with our legislators. It sounds like we already have shared some of that with our legislators. Um, they were also asking for the possibility for um, the, the stories of how we've been dealing with COVID-19 to be shared um, with them as well, just that they um, are keeping track of different districts and um, how, how, the, in, how the schools have been impacted, but also um, in, in reference to an article that was actually um, re, uh, written by uh, Mark Belling, um, kind of condemning schools and acting as if we are not doing the work that we need to be. Um, the schools are actually outlining what actually has been going on to share that there, there's a lot of uh, transformational learning that's been taking place at, during this time. So those are the four things I had tonight. All right, thank you, Kathy. Um, continuing on, uh, board committee reports. Any updates from board committee? I, I can just share that I did attend uh, SWSA with Jonathan on Friday, um, actually last Tuesday, we attended together 
um, the South Southeastern Wisconsin Schools Alliance. Um, and that was my first time um, being in the new role that I am. Um, but I don't know if Jonathan has anything to add there, but uh, they also had a school board meeting on Friday for, for just board members that um, we, we've been discussing issues as well as they relate to the school district. So it's, it's a nice group of 32 school districts from around Southeastern Wisconsin kind of collaborating and discussing legislative matters. So I don't know, Jonathan, if you had anything to share with that. Um, just to add on the telling our story. So there was a school connection that was sent out to all community members in Greendale on what we've been doing. And so I did provide that to SWSA um, so that they've got another example because I think it does a good job of telling the the story of the various roles that we're serving in terms of meals, in terms of providing that essential worker child care, um, in addition to the virtual learning um, which is really important. So I, I, I think that's a very good tool and Kitty's been really helpful with getting that out to our legislators so that we're sure that we're providing um, information on what we've been doing and that that story is clear as they're making, um, uh, as they're trying to understand what it looks like for K-12 schools. All right, thank you. And any other committee updates? I know Noelle, you mentioned that um, CISA one is having their annual meeting uh, tomorrow. Yes, tomorrow um, at the Silver Spring Middle School uh, out in Sussex. So we'll be doing safe distancing and all of that. Um, but yeah, we'll be. I'll be out there tomorrow night. All right. Any other updates? All right. Then we are at the end of our agenda, and we are adjourned. Um, our next board meeting uh, is a work session scheduled for June 1st, but as we talked about earlier, um, we will be getting a, uh, a meeting invitation for a special board meeting next week, Tuesday, um, to uh, take action on prepayment of the WRS debt. So we are that, sure. oh. is That's a seven o'clock meeting also, is that correct? Or? We can do that. Okay. And we'll just confirm it with everyone, but yes, that'll be the, the plan is to do it at seven o'clock on Tuesday. All right, then at this time we are adjourned. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.